Hello friends. This is. God of Fiction. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto reincarnated as son of biblical god? Naruto XDXD crossover. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video. Kuo Academy started as an all-girls private school but at the beginning of spring where the Sakura's trees started to bloom the school started to change from an all-girls private school to co-op school and boys too started to enter school ground. Lord Grammary thought that it would flur up his education program and now amongst his cute students, boys joined the fray. The wind blew through the branches of the trees, picking up the petals of cherry flowers that now floated through the masses of students and a group of girls that were sporting. Their hair danced in the wind while their assets bounced slightly with each step they took. They are members of the tennis club that is led by Kiyom Abe and she guide her members towards their destination. Fight on, fight on, fight on. A busty young girl with brown hair that were in multiple drill-like curls framed her face. Behind her, the members of the tennis club echoed her chant while holding blushes at the thought of where their captain lead them to. Ooh. Issei Sama, 3rd o'clock, S of tennis in sight. Matsuda called to his friend while holding the binoculars against his eyes that were aimed at the two jiggling globes of the tennis club president. Three boys laid in the bushes and each of them held a binoculars that were strained at the athletic girls that were packed in tight almost seen through white tank top and down their smooth, flat stomach to their shapely tight round buttocks packed in blue, small shorts and down their shapely long smooth legs as they passed them while chanting. Fight on, fight on, fight on. When the girls passed them and out of sight, Issei rolled out of the bushes. An average boy with short brown hair and light brown eyes that trailed the tennis club girls as his lips formed a goofy smile and with a lecherous tone he addressed his friends. Matsuda, Motohama, I thought that I have caught a glimpse of Abe Bucko erect s, he he he. Matsuda, Motohama and Issei chanted while making groping movements with their fingers while their eyes took a lecherous form. The infamous hentai Sanin and Gumi as they are called by the students left their hiding place with only one goal in mind. Sneaking across the school ground to their favorite peeking spot to peek at the erotic bodies of the tennis girls that would soon take their showers and show the hentai Sanin and Gumi their lecherous bodies, firm small round s with their erect pink s, their flat stomach and their beautiful crotch that looks delicious to eat. Giggling lecherous the three moved while avoiding any kendo members that took on itself to watch the changing rooms, but as if God had listened to Issei's prayer there were no watchers, better said there is no soul in the wide range of the changing room of the tennis club. Giggling the three boys spoke as one. He he he, I will capture those and become the most amazing king of Japan, I'll become the harem king. Hearing his friends proclaim themselves the harem king, Issei started to glare at his friends for a long time and opened his mouth to retort them when suddenly his ears caught some terrible, horrifying news that would end his peaking time, for today. Hissing at his friends to stay quiet he and his friends crawled through the bushes to listen in to a group of girls that talked about him. Issei's eyes narrowed while he listened to his mortal enemy. I have heard from Ria Senpei that Yudo Senpei and Otsutsuki Senpei will perform today under the Sakura tree to wish us girls luck for white day. That news was received with squeals, cheers and sounds. Kaya. They are both so handsome, smart and funny. An unknown girl spoke her mind. Issei glanced out of the bushes to see three girls hopping on their spot that caused their s to bounce up and down while some of them clasped their hands together between the valley of their heavily s. s. Issei thought when suddenly his bubble busted as the girls left in haste, giggling about White Day's performance. Jumping to his feet the brown-haired boy started to follow the girls on risk of his own life, and that of his friends. Motohama rolled out of the bushes to follow his friend with Matsuda in tow that increased his pace to crawl next to Issei. Matsuda wondered why they left their peaking spot as this is the time that the tennis club members would shower he stated his question to Issei their leader. Issei, why are we following them? The boy in question turned his attention to his best friend with an air. You, pulling, my, leg look while he crawled through the crowd of girls that were breaking up stalls from the White Day Festival and some of them were already moving towards their school's priced Sakura tree that according to rumors grant eternal love if you confess under the tree and the one that you confessed to would accept the wish would come true. But now according to rumors the charming princes of Kuo would held there their performance for all the girls. Crawling through the crowds of students, Issei glanced at Matsuda. Matsuda did you forget what day today is? Earning a shake from his friend, Issei sighed with tears streaming down his face. Today is White Day, the day where we lone men must watch in torture all the happy couples gather together, but it's also the day that those horrible princes, 
Stealers of women held a performance to steal all my, I will not watch how they will steal my passion, my dreams to become the harem king. Issei's self-proclaiming thundered through the school ground, groups of girls and adults turned their attention to the self-proclaimed harem king that cowered under the glares of the kendo club girls that each held a shinai in their hands that were aimed at him. Two girls stepped forward with angry faces and their eyes held the eternal flame of hate against perverts that now cowered at their feet. Murayama's sweet voice cut through the silence that brought shivers down the perverts. Ero Gakusei, you don't proclaim loudly your Ero thoughts on these religious day of love, and don't you dare to ruin Otsutsuki Sama and Yudo Sama's performa. Murayama's warning were cut off when Issei lecherous whispering, Murayama's body measurements are B84W70H81 cm, and Katesa's body measurements are B78W65H79 cm, and Ria. Dang. Two furious kendo users smashed their shinai atop Issei's head that now sported two giant lumps that angrily rose out of his head while he rolled over the floor while the kendo girls slammed their feet in the boy's back while screeching punishments and the adults moved away from the group and towards the highlight of the day. Charming Prince's White Day Performance How dare you call out our body measurements in front of adults and other students, Ero Gakusei, screeched Murayama while slamming her feet in a painful, sensitive spot of all male their crotch as Issei cried loudly that echoed through the school ground. We are not done with your boys, girls get them, Katase ordered with a dark aura while watching the two remaining boys being tortured by her club mates as she laughed falsely. While the hentai Sanin and Gumi were being punished a group of very cute and beautiful students walked past them while glancing at them. Ufufufu, it seems that the infamous hentai Sanin and Gumi are once again punished. Himejima Akeno a young woman with buxom figure said with sadistic streak clearly in her voice. Her very long black hair that she held in a ponytail danced behind her as she skipped and her violet eyes darted to the younger girl that munched at a sweet. What do you think, Kaniko-chan? Don't like him, replied the white-haired shortly. This girl is Tuju Kaniko a small petite girl with white hair and hazel eyes. The front of her hair has two long bangs going past her shoulders and several loose bangs hanging over her forehead while the back has a short bob cut. She also wears a black cat-shaped hair clip on both sides of her hair and she wears the usual Kuo Academy girls' school uniform without the shoulder cape. Kaneko was munching on her sweet bread while sauntering to their destination that her president had organized. Bucko don't you think you was a bit too hard on Kiba to demanding him to play with Otsutsuki-san? Asked Akeno as she followed her king to the upcoming event, her king, Grammarie Rias is a beautiful young woman with long crimson hair that reached her thighs, with a single hair strand sticking out from the top. She also have loose bangs covering her forehead and side bangs framing her beautiful face. She too, like all the students wears at Kuo University she wears the Kuo Academy girls school uniform. Her crimson hair danced behind her in the wind as she moved towards the podium that was built under the Sakura tree while students parted for her, creating a clean path. Rias let out a tinkling laugh while she glided towards the bridge that is the connection between the school's mainland and the island that they affectional called Eden. Why they called the island Eden is for several reasons, from exotic flower beds to the Sakura tree but what every girls know at campus is that they could find there one of the charming princes of Kuo sleeping under the tree. The Grammarie heiress had settled her attention on two boys that could likely strengthen her cause against her fiancé that she very much dislikes. One is a normal human that she suspect have a sacred gear also known as God's artifacts, that are items with powerful abilities bestowed upon humans by the original God from the Bible, his name is Issei Hiodo. Kuo's resident pervert and someone she isn't looking forward to add to her peers. The other she wasn't sure of what he was, he showed great skills in martial arts, kendo and kudo, next to his great prowess he is very intellectual and rivals her scores at school, and one rainy day she stumbled upon him playing two strategic games, Go and Shogi where he crushed his opponents in three to four sets. Rias shivered at the cold gleam that entered his eyes each time he plays Shogi, his eyes looked at the stones as if they were soldiers, his name is. Rias, my king we have arrived, came the soft voice of Akeno that cut off her thoughts about the last person that she wanted to add to her peers. The crimson-haired heiress of Grammarie blinked her eyes to see that she stood atop of the stage, facing all the students, teachers and adults. Her best friend leaned closer to her, whispering. Are you alright, Rias? I am fine, nothing to worry. She whispered back before she straightened her form, rising her head to gaze at her fellow students her teachers and adults that had come here to listen to the two charming princes of Kuo. Clearing her throat, she gazed at the gathered students that were mostly girls, and some young women that had heard about the two handsome men. She raised her hand to the sky as a spotlight flickered on her place, 
basking her in the light. Welcome. Welcome to Kuo University Charming Princes of Eden. Catcalls, cheers and wishes of Mary Me filled the air that caused Rias and Akano to smile while Yuto and Otsutsuki behind the stage to sweat a bit nervously and Kaneko. Kaneko was pulling out Otsutsuki's poxy's stock out of his bag and happily munched the delicious sweet. Rias' voice reverberated through the air again, tonight, Yuto Kiba and Otsutsuki Naruto will performance for all the new and young couples the song, I will be right here waiting for you. Then I want now a grand applause for Yuto Kiba, she thundered as a young handsome man entered the stage. His short blonde hair, his brilliant gray eyes twinkled as he raised his hand to wave at all his fangirls. He is Yuto Kiba a member of Rias Peers, and a knight. Kiba walked up to the piano, taking his seat while facing his public. When the applause slowly died, Rias once again raised her voice to welcome her second prince of her school, and now, I want a thunderous applause for Otsutsuki Naruto. If the applause for Kiba was something then the applause for Naruto paled in comparison with his when a tall young man entered the stage. Suddenly a gust of wind blew his silver-colored bangs out of his handsome face, revealing unique pair of blue, white flower-like eyes that made Rias, Akano, Kaneko and all the other girls a bit weak in the knees, and a bit wet. Naruto have a lean, muscular built like a swimmer and glided like a dancer over the stage and took over the mic. Kanban wa kuo. Naruto's clear, soft voice reverberated through the air as if it seems it came out of a valley, echoing. The young man extended his hand, reaching to his public and brought his thumb and middle finger together, snap. A white rose suddenly appeared in his hand. Today is the day that we proclaim our love to those that have captured our heart. Today is a day two halves of the same apple came together and becomes one. For those, I wish eternal happiness, for you I will play this song with my good friend, Kiba Yuto, I'll be waiting for you. The silver, white-haired young man finished his speech by throwing the lone white rose to the public and to everyone's amazing the rose multiplied until it rained white roses. Naruto walked to his crutch, picking up his guitar he took his seat and his fingers ghosted over the guitar strings. He closed his eyes when his finger pulled a few strings that let the sounds fly into the air, filling the souls to those who listened. The students, adults and teachers clasped their hands together, and some wrapped their arms around their loved one while Naruto and Kiba played the song. In the public a young girl with dark hair searched for her crush, she wears the same Kuo girl's uniform and she searched for her crush with brown hair while back on the stage Naruto's eyes fluttered open, revealing his eyes that shone with warmth and love that brought hearts to the girl's eyes as they cheered and when his melodic voice left his lips, Rias, Akano and Kaneko blushed deeply as if it felt that he sings privately only for them. Oceans apart day after day and I slowly go insane. I hear your voice on the line but it doesn't stop the pain. If I see you next to never how can we say forever? Wherever you go, whatever you do I will be right here waiting for you. Grammary Rias lips moved, singing along with Naruto. Her heart pounded in her chest while she glided towards the young man that had captured many girls hearts tonight. She halted next to him and smiled at him while the public goes wild when she took over the mic and started to sing the next couplet. Whatever it takes, or how my heart breaks I will be right here waiting for you. I took for granted, all the times that I thought would last somehow. I hear the laughter and taste the tears cheers thundered through the air when Rias' voice slowly died down only by replaced by a Kano that sauntered towards Kiba and leaned against the piano, pushing her bust into the air when she laid down on the piano while winking at her audience that goes wild as she teased them while singing her part together with Kiba. But I can't get near you now oh, can't you see it baby? You've got me going crazy, wherever you go, whatever you do. I will be right here waiting for you whatever it takes or how my heart breaks. I will be right here waiting for you, in the audience, girls and boys confessed their loves to each other. Some were holding hands while other pulled their loved ones against their chest as the song filled the air. For others it brought them courage and searched for their crush. Teachers and adults watched the play with the smiles on their faces. The women shed some tears thinking about their first white day where they met the love of their life while the men tried to keep their masculine posture instead of breaking down in tears. I wonder how we can survive this romance but in the end if I'm with you I'll take the chance. Oh, can't you see it baby? You've got me going crazy? Issei glared at Naruto and Kiba. Those two princes of Kuo, how dare they steal my? I will learn them a less. His thoughts were interrupted when someone tapped him on the shoulders and with narrowed eyes and a scowl he looked up only immediately being replaced by a goofy smile when a beautiful, alluring girl stands next to him with a blush adorning her face. H. Hi A. Are you I, Issei? T. 
That's me. Why? replied a perplexed Issei that only deepened her blush. In the background Rias and Naruto had joined together with Rias and Kaneko dancing around the guitarist with smiles. Well Kaneko had a small smile adorning her cute face. I, I L, love you, the girl squealed cutely that made Issei heart to jump. Please go out with me, tonight. Wherever you go, whatever you do I will be right here waiting for you. Whatever it takes or how my heart breaks I will be right here waiting for you. Waiting for you. The melodious voices of Rias and Naruto filled the air when they started at the last couplet and Kaneko in her own cute way repeated the last line with a slight purr that caused all the girls to squeal. Waiting for you. Naruto's finger caressing the last note that echoed through the air that is accompanied by Kaneko's voice that now leaned with her back against his left shoulder while Rias took pose on his opposite side. With Kiba, Akano laid on her belly and S flat on the piano with her index finger against her bottom lip and winked at the audience while Kiba finished the song before he joined the group at the edge of the stage and Akano slid off the piano and wrapped Kiba's arm around her waist and leaned into his chest while their audience burst into applause. A cult research club, a crimson magical circle appeared in the old school building and four people appeared in the room. Stepping out of the circle, Rias Grammary took her seat behind her desk and looked at her peers. Tonight our target has been approached by an fallen angel. If everything goes according plan then we have tonight a new piece that might help us in our cause. Era, you are sure that this boy, Issei Hiodo held a sacred gear? Akano asked. Rias raised her head to look at her best friend that smiled at her. Her eyes then locked on Kiba that rose a brow. What is it? What do you think of Issei? He can become powerful with the right training if his sacred gear wakes up. Kiba voiced his thoughts with a shrug of his shoulder while polishing his swords and Rias smiled at the comment of her knight before turning her attention to her rook, Kaneko Tezu. That pervert is untalented. Kaneko stated her thoughts, nothing more, nothing less, done. The Nekosho doesn't like him and his perversion's habits. She doesn't have a high opinion of him and she doesn't have the trust in him that he could save her bucko from her terrible faith. He might be untalented Kaneko-chan, but he have a sacred gear. Kiba defended the boy. Rias smiled at her knight, glad that someone at least support her in recruiting the young boy even if she don't like his perversion's nature. Putting out courage from her knight's words she addressed Kaneko. Kiba is right Kaneko-chan. He might be untalented but he have what I found out by researching that he have a powerful sacred gear. Tonight Issei Hiodo joins my peers. Kaneko blank expression didn't show her displeasure but everyone could feel that she wasn't happy with him joining them. She unwrapped a pocky and munched on them ignoring the stares from her friends as Rias disappears through the magical circle. Kuo Park. Giggles filled the park at night when a couple chased each other. Darker flowed through the night as Issei tried to catch her but each time she stepped out of his reach. Yuma danced around her new acquired boyfriend with a sweet, gentle smile while dancing out of his reach. I'll get you Yuma-chan. Issei laughed while chasing after his girlfriend. Yuma laughed dancing around the fountain while escaping her boyfriend's groping fingers until he caught her and they fell together on the soft bed of grass. You finally caught me, Issei-kun. I finally caught you, Yuma-chan, repeated Issei, see, can I you? You can, if you do something for me, Yuma said while she sits up and extended her hand to let Issei help her get up back to her feet. The hopeful expression of Issei caused her to laugh and she danced around the fountain while facing him. Issei followed her while almost losing his footing when she trailed with a finger between the valley of her S that brought a silly grin to her boyfriend's face. Issei-kun, can you die for me? S. Sure Yuma-chan, drawled Issei mindlessly with the thought of her in his mind and a few seconds passed before her mind registered her wish. Issei's eyes immediately locked on his girlfriend's that gazed at him with a predator look. E. Eh I thought I heard you wrong, can you repeat what you said? Yuma's lips stretched forming a sweet smile while inching away from him. Sure Issei-kun, I will repeat what I asked from you. Listen careful, ufufufu, can you please die for me? He heard it wrong, he was sure of it, this wasn't his sweet girlfriend that asked something this ridiculous of him dying. No, this was a cruel joke of God, he was sure of that. A fearful expression took place from his once joyful expression as he pointed an index finger at Yuma. With shaking voice he asked his girlfriend. Why? Yuma, you a, are joking, are, right? Yuma jumped in the air, her clothes shattered and revealed a beautiful forbidden erotic body with large, round tight globes with pink erect S that were soon covered in black leather micro corset that revealed a lot of skin. 
His eyes glided down her smooth flat belly to her clean crotch where he could see that her snatch were partly parted and showed pink skin that were covered by a micro G string that didn't hide her twat at all. Blood seeped out of his nose while he let his eyes roam her erotic form when suddenly two black wings spread behind her back that held her airborne while she extended a hand to her boyfriend where a white light gathered and formed a spear. I am dreaming, this must be a dream, an erotic good looking girlfriend flying in the air. And I have seen, yes, this must be a dream, Issei thought that came to an end when a spear pierced him and blood pooled around him. The last thing he saw was a young man with silver, white hair that spoke to him. Do you want to be released from your pain, from your burden and from those that want to abuse you? Came his silk voice that floated through the air. I can help you leave all that behind, a second chance at life, what do you say? Issei didn't know which burden but he did know about his pain, his life that is seeping out of him. If this person could grant him a second chance at life, he will take it. Why? Yes, please, I want a life. Then I will take your burden from you. I will gift you, Issei a second chance at life, came the mysterious voice of the person before he surrendered to unconscious. A crimson glow erupted between the trees that slowly grew in strength as a magical circle appeared on the ground with the Gremory family crest. Slowly a person grew out of the seal, rising up with the first thing that appeared was crimson hair that fell past her shoulders, a buxom chest that jumped slightly followed with the rest of her body. Grammarie Rias had appeared on the scene and the magical circle disappeared from under her feet. Rias stepped through the trees to the clearing where she could see Issei and Yuma chase each other while laughter filled the air. She hid herself in the shadows of the trees and watched Yuma transform in a fallen angel and summoned an holy spear that pierced Issei's chest and blood pooled around him. Don't worry Issei, I will soon resurrect you in one of my pieces. Thought the crimson-haired ruined princess while she waited for the right time to appear. At the moment fighting and fallen angel is dangerous due her holy spells and a huge chance that she vaporized her soon to be sacred gear holder. With a sickening stomach she watched Yuma torture the boy until she sighed boringly, stretched her wings and took flight. At this moment Issei had lost a lot of blood and Rias decided it was not the time to step in to save her future peace but then to her shock she saw someone else appear on the scene. She couldn't resurrect Issei if a stranger is there that doesn't know anything about the supernatural world, and with a beating heart she watched until the stranger would leave but he didn't, instead he walked up to Issei and crawled next to him and started to, talk. Do you want to be released from your pain, from your burden and from those that want to abuse you? Came his silk voice that floated through the air. I can help you leave all that behind, a second chance at life, what do you say? Issei didn't know which burden but he did know about his pain, his life that is seeping out of him. If this person could grant him a second chance at life, he will take it. Why? Yes, please, I want a life. No, no, this can't be happening, another devil, Rias thought enraged, her hand bailed into fists as she could do nothing but listen. She decided to study this new person and to her surprise she recognized said person. He is Otsutsuki Naruto. In exchange for your second chance at life, I take your sacred gear, enjoy your second round of life, Issei Hyodo. Otsutsuki Naruto whispered softly that Rias caught before he flashed through hand seals and a barrier erected around them, preventing anyone to interrupt. He said what? Take his sacred gear? No, Rias mentally shouted. Jumping to her feet she sprinted towards the barrier, summoning her powers of destruction that she slammed against the barrier. To her shock there was no scratch made on the barrier and with enraged crimson aura she increased her powers to get in the barrier to save her peace. Inside the barrier Naruto's hands were covered in crimson aura that sunk into Issei's left arm and pulled out emerald jewel that slowly sunk into his own skin. Naruto's eyes gleamed at the sight of the jewel as it slowly sank in his arm until it was whole absorbed by him and that's when he raised his head, his eyes caught the lustrous form of one Grammary Rias that smashed her powers of destruction against his barrier that started to show cracks that spread with each hit. The young silver, white-haired man watched in amazing at one of great ladies of Kuo destroy his barrier slowly. I don't have much time left. Better heal this pervert before he is lost for sure. Naruto glanced down at the boy as he healed him and the hole in his chest shrunk until there was nothing left, not even a scar. Arg. Rias roared while raising both her arms in the air and gathered a ball of destruction magic before slamming it down against the barrier. Her crimson her floated behind her in an eerily, scary way while her eyes gleamed unholy. Go down. You stupid barrier. I said, go down. The crimson-haired ruined princess smashed her power of destruction against the barrier that groaned under the strength of her magic, cracks crawled over the whole surface of the barrier that then shattered in million pieces. 
Grimori Rias towered above the mysterious boy, Oksatsuki Naruto with her bailed fists while breathing heavily. And you, what did you do to my sacred gear user? Naruto who had just finished his healing process on the boy shivered under the intense glare of the Grimori Eris that drilled into him. Each step she took Naruto could feel the earth groan, her intense aura lashed out around him and before he knew it he was lifted into the air by her. She held him up by his collar of his school uniform and their eyes locked with each other. One a calm, white, blue while that of Rias was an angry blue-green that flashed with contained rage. Naruto, what did you do to my sacred gear piece? No better said are you a devil or angel? Naruto laughed sheepishly. Issei was safe and a beautiful girl held him up in the air. What could a man wish for? Deciding to answer this goddess, he smiled at her. I am no angel nor devil, I am an oni. Oh oni. And no way are you an oni. Rias shouted while crashing her forehead against his, closing the distance to stare in his eyes. There are no oni anymore, the last one was from the Otsutsuki clan. She suddenly let Naruto slip from her hands to stare at him in disbelief. She blinked once, then twice before jumping away from him and pointed a shaking index finger at him. You are an oni. Yes. Yes I am. Deadpan Naruto while picking up Issei and sauntered out of the park, leaving a frozen devil behind. Said devil progressed the last news before she knocked herself back in the living world and dashed after the oni while raising her hand, shaking to get his attention. Otsutsuki Naruto is an oni, a rare species of human hybrids with powers that rivals the gods according to legends, and now he have possession of a sacred gear. I can't let him slip out of my grasp. With her decision made she ran after the oni, calling out to him. Naruto, wait for me, Naruto. The three beings, one human, one an oni and the last one a devil left the park. None of them noticed a dark, shadowy figure watching them depart and after a moment he vanished into the shadows of the trees. Naruto please become a peerage in my group, pretty please. The young man groaned while dropping Issei at the human's parents house before he left him, hoping to keep him out of trouble and now he must deal with a young devil, great. He would have wished that he had never showed his powers or what he was. With a heavy sigh he vanished in a whirl of leaves, leaving a dumbstruck devil behind. Stalking devils and arrow Nako-chan, shiver, 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 Otsutsuki Naruto glanced over his shoulder to the source of his shivers. A pair of blue-green eyes glared at him from around the corner the whole morning. If he looks in the mirror, he sees those eyes, when he take a piss in the bathroom. The first things he sees when he leaves the bathroom are those pair of eyes, when he sits in class right now. He glanced back over his shoulder, he sees those pair of eyes. What's wrong with her? Why is she staring at me? Muttered one of the princes of Kuo while a group of girls gathered around him, offering him bento boxes that he took with a smile until that dreadful feeling returned. Shiver, shiver, shiver. Kami-sama please let that horrifying feeling fly away. Thought the young man while accepting some bento boxes with a smile, he promised that he would join their cooking lessons today. Fly, fly away. Fly, fly away. Naruto chanted mentally while keeping a smile plastered on his face. Naruto-sama is joining today's cooking lessons, Kai, the sensitive ears of Naruto caught the squeals of the girls around him. Sighing he looked up, his eyes wandered off to the clock on the wall that were a few minutes away from the break, another sigh escaped him. I bet he can cook western meals, I so want to taste his cooking, Kai. No, it's me that's going to taste his cooking. Another girl joined the fray and soon the lesson was full of screaming girls. Rolling his eyes exasperated he glanced once over his shoulders to see those eyes firmly locked at him. Shiver. Wink. Rias Gremory did not just wink at him. He blinked once, then twice and yep, there it is again, wink. Okami-sama or better said, brother, Otsutsuki Hagoromo why did you in Kami's name send me back to our birth planet? The place where the old factions were afraid of us, no they are still afraid of us. That reaction that, that Grammary girl had when I told her that I was an Oni, she was definitely terrified, right, right, nay, no, Naruto deflated on his own thoughts, how can my own thoughts betray me? Ufufufu, Naruto-sama. Our crimson goddess is not terrified of you, no, no long shot not. You know, I can smell her arousal from her, nya. Listen to my advice this time, pick her up and press her against the wall in the classroom and rip off her skirt and trail your fingers along her neither lips until they part and turn moist from arousal and then, you take her, a lecherous feline voice echoed through his head that's accompanied with laughter from the others. Her pink lips parts while she pants out your name, begging you to take her. Nibby. 
Naruto mentally shouted while trying to hide his erect glorious tool that grew from the UAL tone of one of his tenants from the girls that surrounding him that somehow have blushes on their faces as if they know what just played in his head. I don't need that now. Tisk, how did Yugito hold on her sanity for so long with you in her mind? Now you are trying to corrupt me. Giggles echoed through his mind. Yugito, she didn't, uf 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 u. You didn't know that my former container did rape you in your sleep? Several times if I might add, she rode your delicious too. Naruto's eyes widened when Nibi told him what Yugito did to him in his sleep, several times. Those thoughts didn't help his current problem at all. Naruto sighed in relief when the school bell rang and the class streamed empty and Naruto could gasp for air and calm his erection a bit before he would move. Slowly, oh so slowly he left the class, sticking his head out of the doorpost to scan his surrounding and deemed it safe. Releasing his breath he stepped through the halls when suddenly the sound of a clearing throat echoed through the hall. Whipping his head in the direction of the sound, his eyes widened when he noticed that girl leaning against the wall, she have long, crimson hair, a pair of blue-green eyes that haunted him the whole day, and those eyes were firmly locked on him. Hello, Oni. Ria's lips stretched in a predator smile when she noticed the pale skin of Naruto turn paler, and the audible gulp. Can I join you for lunch, Na, Ru, Tasama? She stepped closer, trailing her finger down his cheek, followed down his sculpture chest and ended at his crotch that jumped back to his erect state. The crimson-haired beauty eyes narrowed slightly while a blush now adorned her cheeks. Oh my! This not what you feels every day. But can I join you for lunch today? What is this? Is Kami ing me? First that horny nako that tries to get my mind in the gutter, and now a devil that stalks me, and is in heat. Curse my brother, and where is mother when you need her? The silver, white-haired Kuo student mentally wailed and in the same time scanned his surrounding for a fast way out. Not seeing a way out he dropped death, meaning he invited her to join him in the Garden of Eden for lunch. Immediately a pair of arms wrapped around his left arm and guided him out of the school. Naruto mentally groaned when the laughter in his head increased that caused him some headaches. But the voice that was the clearest of all was from his over niece, Nibi that shouted at him. Come on Oji-san. I know that you want it. Look at those smooth long legs, and imagine when they are wrapped around your waist while you impale the young devil. Better said, impale her here in the middle of the hallway where everyone can see how you claim her, uf 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 u. Ria's smirked next to him, pushing Naruto's arm deeper into her cleavage and unknowingly cheering on Nibi in Naruto's head whom started to show her container images of Ria's aroused expressions, once impaled by her oji-san. The crimson-haired ruin princes guided Naruto through the hallway down the stairs and out of the school and towards the Garden of Eden while on occasionally hearing students whisper about Rias having found a boyfriend? Look, it's Gremory Oni-sama and is that, oh my, it's Otsutsuki-sama. They look so good together, Mo, we must spread this happy news. Naruto frowned at all the whispering while mentally retreated back into his mind, I can't wait until this day is over, have mercy. The crimson-haired ruin princess was thinking a plan to get this young man in her peerage. Last night after her failed attempt or better said cutting loose of her idea of recruiting a normal human without any sacred gear she started to delve herself into her family's library to find all the known information about Oni beings. Sadly and much to her disappointment there wasn't much about Oni beings, only that they have certain attributes that far surpassed devils or angels, for example an almost unlimited stamina, high regeneration that surpassed the Phoenix clan's own regeneration ability in something that is almost count as legend, and third eye. Only Oni knows the right term but we devils and angels did described it as a third eye with terrifying powers, and that was what she all found out in the single small black book that her family possess. Time to mess with the young devil, uf 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 u, and feline, husky voice echoed through her mind while two unmatched but unique eyes descended upon her that removed the knowledge of ever hearing her. Back to Rias, she placed the small black book on her desk just when the library door slid open and Akano entered the library. Strangely she have cat ears and two tails that were blue-black in color. Bucko, did you find anything about Otsutsuki Naruto? Akano asked. Her blue-black flaming cat ears twitched to every sound in the room while she placed a tray of tea and cookies on the desk and started to fill a cup with calming tea. The busty dark-haired girl glanced at the small book and picked it up and started to browse through it. After a while she stopped at a page and raised an elegant brow. Era, enhanced condition, looks nice for a rowdy night in bed don't you think bucko, n-y-a. Akano. Don't say something like that. Rias yelled at her best friend with a huge blush. Akano just shrugged her shoulders with a smile. You only yells cuz I am right, nay Rias-chan. 
You are not. Huffed the Crimson Princess, crossing her arms under her S and pushed them a bit up while closing her eyes. By closing her eyes, she didn't notice the evil gleam in her friend's eyes or that it changed to two feline cat eyes, and that the corner of her lips quirked up in a sultry smile. Silently as a cat, Akano sneaked towards her king, her fingers twitched in groping motions while she appeared behind Rias. Got ya. Kaya. Rias screamed when her best friend groped her s. Her young sensitive s were fondled by Akino's skilled hands as if her s are dough in the master's hand that caused her body heat to increase and a faint blush adorned her face. Sweat drops made their way down her skin and into the valley of her large, fondled s. A. Akeno. S. Stop. Ah. I. Id. Demand why. You too. Ah. S. Stop. Rhea's lips parted while small heat clouds escaped her lips, she arched her back that caused to push her remarkable, soft firm round s into the air under the gentle care of Akano whom giggled perversely behind her and the crimson-haired ruined princess became pudding in her hands while her mind turned blank and screamed out Akino's name. Ah, a, Akano. The grammary heiress screamed, she arched her back and pushed her s into the air to Al to see. Luckily for her there were only two people that had a private show, one Kaneko Taju whom was munching a chocolate cake and one Otsutsuki Naruto whom watched the whole show with a frown. Rhea's blurry view took notice of someone talking to her while her mind tried to register the person. Dot Ias, Rias, hey, wake up, Rias, Rias, damn. The sounds of someone's voice now reached her ears. She blinked her eyes twice before her blurry view slowly took a sharper sight and the worried expression of one Otsutsuki Naruto came in view. His unique eyes stared intensely into that of her own and she could feel that something unknown aura hung in the air. Are you alright, Grammarie san The girl blinked a few times before she slowly nodded, telling that she was alright. She noticed that her head laid on the lap of the oni and that she probably had fallen asleep while the dream slowly seeped back into her mind and a huge blush adorned her face. With a small, stuttering she apologized for her unbecoming behavior that naruto waved it off with a small smile it's all right grammarie san and if you will i keep that private show for my own private collection he jested while sending kaneko a wink whom stared aphetic back at him before she turned her attention to her king big s are not everything kaneko drawled softly before she continued munching her now sugar-coated bread that she received from naruto or more specially she had smelled something sweet and claimed it as her price much to the amusement of the oni it tastes great. Thank you Nako-chan. I did made it myself. Naruto said proudly and Rias looked betrayed at her rook with a depressive look. Kaneko blinked a few times at the unexpected reply. A small smile her pink lips formed at this unexpected discovery and inched closer to him, and then gazed with a cute stern expression him straight in the eyes. I expect more tomorrow, the aphetic girl ordered. Naruto blinked at the strange order but the cute, large amber eyes of the young girl wrapped him around her finger tightly the prince of kuo could only hung his head at the casual demand of the nekomata before he slowly and careful raised his hand and placed it gently on the top of her head when nothing happened except that she looked at him with large cat eyes he started to fondle her hair and to his amazing she leaned in and soft purring sounds escaped her i bring you more only on one demand kaneko's eyes fluttered open to look at him once more questioning silently his demand he chuckled while continuing caressing her hair that brought out more cat-like sounds from the girl. Only if I can keep continuing doing this to you, my cute little mascot. Hi, purr. Kaneko contently leaned in more while enjoying her two favorite things in the world. One is petting and the other is eating sweets, and what's better than sweets made by a prince of Kuo? Nightfall, abandoned church, at the edge of the small village an abandoned church looked over the village from atop the small mountain. Priests and their followers had left the church long ago when strange, unknown supernatural accidents happened. Holy followers died unexpectedly with holes in their chests, limbs were removed and scattered through the church. Dark clouds always gathered around the church, blocking the light of all, good and hope for centuries. And tonight, tonight the screams of tortured souls echoes in its walls as three shadow like being glided towards the church without care and vanished into the shadows of the unholy church's entrance. We have gathered here today brother and sisters to choose an human sacrifice one of the shadow like being spoke its voice aphetic with a bit of malice mixed those that are gathered in the church wears baggy cloaks that hid their form well anyone a slight idea or thought of appointing someone for the feast of vernal equinox murmurs escaped the gathers people all looked at each other from under their capes that obscures their faces in the shadows only revealing their slight crimson eyes 
The one that had spoken first could hear the whispers that floated in the air, rapid hand movements, their secret Morse code and he could decrypt that some of his fellow peers had already chosen for the Feast of Vernal Equinox. A slight smirk graced his lips as he demanded attention. It seems that we have found our honored guest, let us have some fun, with a nun. Muahaha. For Grigori. Roared the shadow like beings before they one by one vanished into the shadows, leaving the church abandoned once again. A cold, strong breeze floated through the church, carrying the cries of the tortured souls that are doomed for all of eternity to be imprisoned on this unholy ground, and soon a new soul will join them. Kuo, kitchen paradise, girl's opinion, nya, swish, a spatula attacked the content in the bowl, creating a whirlpool that threaded dangerously leaving the bowl, an inch under the edge and almost escapes. But the person in control masterly mixed the content that copulated, and gave birth to, Do. A pink atmosphere with little stars engulfed the prince of Kuo while he released the bowl and the content flew high into the air. A non-existence breeze parted his bangs, his eyes slowly parted and the girl's pheromone increased at the innis that he radiated as they had hearts replaced their eyes. Moo, three, they squealed, and two familiar faces were in the audience, watching the handsome prince. Naruto, yes you have guessed that right, held his promise and is giving out a show in the kitchen. At the moment, our prince of Kuo is cooking. Not that boring cooking what we do at home but a spectacular show. His hands moved at lightning speed, gathering his ingredients, placed them at the right spot while placing a frying pan on the fire and dumped some meat in it with some oil that started to hiss angrily. Plop, the dough returned to surface of the furnace, gathering everyone's attention. The young prince's hands hovered above the dough before it gently sunk in the soft, tight dough. His fingers worked with holy skills kneading the dough before stretching it gently under his palm while the girls watched him work with huge blushes, imagining him doing that to their growing round, firm dough. Era, era Oji Chan, I knew it that deep down a pervert was hidden, came the husky voice of his tenant. A pair of unmatched unique eyes watched him from his mindscape how his skillful fingers caressed the dough. Nibby could practically taste the arousal in the kitchen as girls rubbed their tights together, their arms pushed their ample bosoms up, while they panted heavily and maybe Oji Chan get finally laid after his little, erotic show. Ignore, ignore that over -wise growing cat. Concentrate on your work, on the dough, dough. S, softly whispered Nibby in his mind. Dough, just a bit more kneading, gently, yes gently caressing those. S, Nibby interjected with a giggle. S gently massaging those soft, firm round brea. Nibby. The cook mentally shouted, his pale skin gained some red color when he noticed what slowly corrupted his mind, and he noticed a few things too around him. First all the girls stared at him with hearts in their eyes while rubbing their tights, and they, moaned. Second is that his hand kneaded the dough that took form of S. And last two pair of eyes that glared at him. Oh Kami, have mercy. EHM, now that they are carefully massaged we can add the roasted meat in the dough that I have separated and then we finish it by sealing the opening with paper before we steam the buns. The boy explained hastily while the girl's eyes turned to their normal state. Giggling the cooking club joined him at the furnace. Each of them picked up the S-formed dough and rolled them out, flat against the surface before picking up a spoon and spread out some steamed meat on the surface before rolling them up and sealed the bottom. The girls then placed the buns in a row of three by three in a bamboo steaming basket that was placed above boiling water. It tastes very good, Naruto Senpei. One of the girls said that leaned dangerously close to him. He could feel her ample s rubbing against his arm while she ignored what she is doing. Your explanation is very easy to follow, and quite funny too. Care to join our club, Naruto Senpei? Another girl joined him on the other side, sweating Naruto send them a heart smelting smile that caused them to rub their tights together. How dare those girls speak to my own private sweet maker? I don't like it at all, NYA. I don't share my sweets with anyone, that I swear on my pride of Nekosho, NYA. The owner of a pair of brown eyes thought while she glared at the girls, an angry hiss escaped her lips as she marched up to him, her hand lashed out to him and sunk her claws into his arm. Feeling suddenly a row of sharp claws sunk in his soft flesh, Naruto yelped and launched himself in the air, knocking over boiling water over his hand. Another yelp escaped his lips and suddenly he laid on his back, as fingers grasped his scruff like a kitten that froze him on the spot while the petite cute mascot of Kuo dragged out the poor boy while all the girls watched him go with the depressive clouds hanging above their heads. Rias watched them go, giggling to herself while following them from a distance. Scoffing, 
Kaneko dragged Naruto down the hall, and down the stairs with occasional screams of the boys as he bounced down the stairs while she holds surprisingly tight his scruff while students and teachers watched the pair leave the school building. Rias giggled when she took notice of the cute, rare expression of Kaneko-chan that had inflated her cheeks cutely, her brows crunched together as she marched towards the old school building where they housed the occult research club while slowly a dark aura seeped out of her that made Naruto shiver much to the amusement of Rias. Naruto, bad kitty. Kaneko hissed. Her leg lashed out, kicking the old school building doors open before she continued stamping through the building, muttering something about kitten bells and lines. Another door swung open and Naruto sailed through the headquarter of the occult research club. He landed face first in the soft sofa before air escaped his lungs when a certain Nekosho landed on his back, wrapping her legs around his waist while she lowered her face, sniffing him. What's this scent? It's familiar. Kaneko thought while she unconscious rubbed her lower region against his back. Her hands spread across his broad, muscular back while she lowered now her flat chest, and nudged her face against his neck. What is this warm, familiar feeling? It's so comfortable, so serenity, it feels like home, like Nekosho. Immediately her eyes snapped open and she stared at him with wide, surprising eyes. Her brown eyes now contained shock, disbelief and a slight amount of hope. The Nekosho couldn't believe that she had found someone that survived the massacre. In her hope she forget that her kind had already told her that he was an Oni, but for now she wanted desperately believe that he was a Nekosho and with tears in her eyes she fell asleep on him. I have found my family, NYA. While Kaneko was inspecting, and reassuring herself of Naruto being a Nekosho, Rias watched the whole scene with wide eyes at the unexpected but adorning behavior of her rook. The crimson-haired ruin princess didn't want to ruin her rook's sleep but she needed to know his answer. She had first stalked him in the morning before accompanying Naruto during the day, and she believed that he was a good addition to her peerage. But before she could gain the attention of Naruto or waking up her rook, Naruto silenced her by chopping her unconscious and vanished with both the girls from the occult clubhouse to his own place. Good job, kitten. Strip them off their clothes and ravage their hot, steamy bodies. Release your carnal lust on them. Release your carnal lust in the name of Matabi Nobakeneko. NYAAA. Nibi meowed seductively in Naruto's mind. Let them howl only your name in the night in their carnal desire of you. Impale them with your sweaty hard thick. Matabi. Be silenced. Hitomi. Gyuki. Shomei. Saiken. Kakuo. Sun Goku. Isobu and Shukaku roared together, silencing her. Matabi pouted but all her energy returned when she noticed her container's own natural form being joined by two other that were clearly girls. Otsutsuki Naruto go them, Matabi, be silenced. Otsutsuki residence, an ancient Japanese palace with several towers with their traditional curved roof tiles watched over the small village from down the hilltop. The palace is the original Himeji castle or what the locals called it, Hakuro Jo or Shirasagu Jo that is translated in western tongue white egret castle or white heron castle because of its white exterior and supposed resemblance to a bird taking flight. The Himejima castle consisted of 83 buildings which only the main building being used by the owner. Around the building and within its walls was the famous Kokoan Garden, a Japanese garden created by his mother before she left this world. Now, returned and claimed what was his, Otsutsuki Naruto sits in a Siza position in the main room on a stage that is slightly higher than the floor with on his opposite his guests. The Otsutsuki heir wears the traditional white yukata, with black tomos adorning the edge of his sleeves and collar that is slightly parted, revealing his muscular chest. His blue-white eyes stared at the heiress of Gremory that has changed her usual Kuo's school uniform to a pink kimono with flower petals adorning her dress with seating next to her, her rook. Kaneko Tuju too had changed her usual attire to almost mirror Naruto with his white yukata but the only difference is that her tomos were replaced with small black cats that were the same as her hairpin. Kaneko stared at him with her aesthetic expression before gliding towards the small dinner table with several dishes that consists of small buns that were filled with sweet bean paste or what is called manju in the form of mice with including tails. Next to the manju Kaneko's almost lost her self-control when her eyes landed on the delicious taijaki that is a traditional Japanese sweet snack in the form of a koi. Kaneko shivered in pleasure when her eyes landed on a stack of sweet delicious dango and she hissed when Rhea's fingers inched closer before retreating to another plate with sweets before she hissed again much to the amusement of her king. Giggling, Rhea's looked up to her host and smiled. Hey eyes took all in the delicious treat in front of her and the scent waved towards her that made her mouth water in hunger. This looks all very delicious Naruto, but where are we? Thank you, 
I hope you like some sweets, and for this place. This place is the original Himeji castle that belonged to an ancient royal clan that goes by the name of Otsutsuki. My clan exactly and all the surrounding as far as the eye can see belongs to said clan. Naruto Ephetic told his guests and reached for a dango that he brought to his lips and took a bite. This small gesture signaled that the others may join the feast and Kaneko immediately reached out for the Taijaki Kyo and nibbled excitedly with her eyes closed. Rias too reached out for some food, she chose some manju and her fingers inched closer until they were only three inches away from her targets when suddenly a closed fan landed hard on her fingers and she retreated her fingers in shock. She looked down at her fingers that now spotted a red mark at where the fans had landed and she immediately glared at her rook and used her other hand to reach out for something else namely dango before there too a fan landed on her fingers that caused her to yelp. Her right eye twitched in annoying, she raised her voice to berate her peerage. Kaneko, stop that, how could you hit me with a fan? Said Nekosho stared aphetic at her while munching at her taijaki koi that vanished within minutes and Rias stubbornly tried once again, reaching out for some manju this time but again there came the fan that punished her for becoming too close, Kaneko. The host only laughed at the small display of servant and master while holding innocently a fan in the sleeve of his yukata. Deciding to stop his small amusement he cleared his throat and gained the attentions of the two girls. Ladies, please I have made enough for everyone. There is no need for fighting about a little bit of sweets, nay? You are right, my apologies for our childish behavior. She sent Kaneko a withering glare that just gazed back with her usual aesthetic expression that only infuriated the crimson-haired ruined princess more. She reached out again, but this time with some caution and to her relief nothing happened and she could enjoy the sweets. Taking a few bites, savoring them and enjoyed the sweet taste on her tongue until she finally gulped it down with a content sigh. Ah, oh, that hit the spot, this is pretty good. Naruto took her praise with a curt nod while enjoying the sweets and unexpected on the table a can of orange juice appeared out of nowhere much to the amazement of his guests. Curtly pours the cups full and placed them in front of them before taking his former position and brought his cup in the air which the two girls, Kaneko and Rias followed and they in union toasted, Kase. They brought the cups to their lips and took a sip after the toast. Kaneko was immediately captivated by the fresh, sweet taste of the juice and immediately reached out for a second cup and Rias joined her. After some cups and the plates with sweets were brought away magically and bento boxes appeared with some leftovers for school later after their small meeting, Rias decided it was now the best time to know him better, learn something about his kind and maybe get him in his peerage. She looked around and noticed actually for the first time since the sunlight poured through the open windows the beauty of the main room. Her eyes landed on the walls that were actually one large painting with the ancient landscapes with giant twin mountains within between a beautiful valley that is rich of animals flowers and trees while as she looked further she noticed four figures with a woman in the middle that surrounded by boys, who are they? Kaneko and Naruto followed her gaze towards the painting and once noticed a smile appeared on his face. He pushed himself off the floor and mentioned them to follow him and soon the three stands before the painting. Their host started to point with his fingers on a few figures and started to tell what the painting described. Long ago, before the time of devils and angels, even before the time of the Christian, Yukai ruled the world. I was born in the mythical land of Genshukyu or in western language, land of illusions or land of fantasy. Rias and Kaneko's eyes widened at the mention of his birthplace. According to humans, Genshukyu was a desolated, haunted region of Japan but original it was a paradise with unnatural wealth and riches but when the Christian god invaded Genshukyu and saw for the first time the land of illusion he felt something that he soon recognized as jealousy and desired to have my homeland as his own. Those in the painting are the rulers of Genshukyu and guardians. My mother, my two elder brother and I are pictured there before we left this dimension. Kaneko stared intently at the painting, her eyes scanned the masterly art as she saw the difference animals of monkeys, birds where some of them looked like phoenixes, and other like eagles but what captured her were the cat-like creatures with two tails. She trailed her fingers along the blue-black flaming cats while tilting her head slightly to look at Naruto and spoke in a soft, curious voice with a hint of sadness her question. Are those Nekomata and Nekosho? Her host and Rias too looked at the Nekosho lookalike, and Naruto stepped a bit closer to her to look too at the flaming cats. He crouched a bit down to be on the same height as the Nekosho and mirrored her action by tracing the cats' figures. They are not Nekomata or Nekosho, Kaneko. They are their ancestors and my servants. They are my most loyal servants and are close to me, close as family can get and they called themselves, Bakaneko. 
Kaneko's eyes darkened a bit in sadness when he told that they were not of her kind but before she could delve more in her depression he surprised her that they were her ancestors and that they were his servants and like the Grammarie clan he saw them as a part of his family. She softly repeated her ancestor's name before she looked up at him. Is that why I could smell the scent of my kind from you, Naruto Senpei? Oh, you caught my scent. Chuckled the Oni and rubbed her head gently where she leaned into, enjoying the loving feeling that brought many memories back to her, happy memories. I'll tell you later why I have the scent of the Bakaneko, a small secret between the two of us, okay? Hi, Senpei, Kaneko purred while Rias pouted at being left out of that secret. You told us that your clan and you left this dimension, why? Rias asked. Naruto paused in showering Kaneko of head rubs that she 100% against at the sudden halt of pleasure. She gripped his hand and placed it back on her head until he continued much to her joy. When the biblical god became sick with greed from the beginning his eyes laid on Genshukyu, he started a war by creating a terrifying monster named Trihexa. Rias and Kaneko gaped at the mention of Trihexa. Trihexa drove us out of Genshukyu since we were young and my mother could not fight at her full strength without uprooting everything, and so she decided to leave this dimension with the thought of one day returning to claim what is ours. That bastard created that monster and caused your clan to flee. Rias growled out, her hands bailed into fists. Kaneko tasked herself to wrap her arms around his arm and leaned into his body while he rubbed her back. He did, confirmed Naruto. W. What happened to my ancestors? came the small voice of Kaneko. I guess that he banished the Bakaneko clan and those others that sided with my clan from the land of illusion that the biblical god claimed for himself and made his own place and christened it to a shadow of its former self, Garden of Eden. She said nothing, staying quiet but the tightening around his arm said volume. They stayed like that for some time before he continued his tale. My mother created a portal to a new portal and took us with her where we arrived in a place plagued by war, chaos and death. Years turned to centuries and my brothers and I learned to control our gifts and we were happy until he showed up once more. This time he tried to take my mother with him but by that time we were much stronger than him and we drove him away. But he did found another way to let my family suffer when he planted the silly idea of peace by sharing our powers with those war mongrels mortals. My eldest brother, Otsutsuki Hagoromo ventured down the mountain where we lived and spread his ninshu, his words of peace and understanding. The whole time when he spoke about his brother and ideals he spoke in a phetic tone. The girls watched him, his eyes turned to his second eldest brother and his mother. Then one day he saved a human with his powers and he gave her a small part of his powers and to his joy she took his ninshu to heart but he then noticed that he hadn't enough to spread his powers or his ninshu. Again, one night the biblical god visited our new realm and he started to poison the eldest brother's thoughts and that's when my brother did something stupid. He used his Banbutsu Sozo no Jutsu or creating of all things. He used his technique on me, his own brother and changed me in a grotesque creature, the ten-tailed beast. But that wasn't everything as he took a step further and cut off my soul that became the chakra in the air while my body roamed the world and spread chaos, destruction and death. It wasn't long after my disappearing that my brother and mother found out what happened and my mother in her rage caused more destruction, chaos and death in the name of gathering my chakra to restore me. The girls had their hands against their lips, eyes wide in horror at the story that their host told in an ephetic tone. They had never thought that the biblical god was such a dark, jealousy, greedy monster and they could see how he gave birth to Trihexa and how dark his followers actual are, his exorcists. No more, please stop don't tell more. I beg you. Rias whispered with a quivering lip, and tears trailing down her cheeks while pulling him into a hug while he kept staring at the painting of his family. Please, no more. Hearing the broken voice of Rias and feeling their shivering bodies pressing against his, he turned his attention to them to look at their tear-streaked faces. They shivered horrible and it teared his heart to see them like this and he wrapped them in his arms and gently soothed their back. Okay, let me wrap something up. It's nothing horrifying, I promise. Promise. Came the small voice of Kaneko. Naruto smiled at her and brought her closer to him, I promise. Kaneko and Rias gave a quick nod to signal him that he could wrap it up. My brother by splitting me, he caused each part of my being grow their own being in forms of giant animals with tails, including my soul that many years later saw his chance to reborn. Each part of my being turned in a mass of my powers and the numbers of tails showed how powerful they are. If I now would release my most powerful form then I would rival or surpass red and trihexa, but so far I have not yet mastered all my forms. The girls were stunned at his claim. He just claimed to being stronger than red and trihexa in his most powerful form. 
They didn't want to imagine what kind of destruction he could do when he go full out but they were glad to hear that he hadn't mastered all his forms, yet. But a second thought is, what are his forms and how powerful would he be? A clearing of a throat brought them out of their musing and they looked up at their host's face that smiled down at them. It is hard for me to say this, but it is time to get ready for school. Rias and Kaneko reluctantly untangled from his arms but to Kaneko's surprise he held her longer while letting Rias go. He wrapped now both his arms around her petite frame while nuzzling his face into her hair, much to Rias growing jealousy. I want to talk to you what longer, Kaneko-chan. Hi, squeaked the petite girl while Rias stared at them. Alone please, Rias. We will join you soon. Naruto requested and Rias left them reluctantly and left the room to prepare herself for school. Once they were alone Naruto released the Neko show and turned her around so they faced each other. Kaneko tilted her head slightly that made her ten time cuter in his opinion and he must strain all his self control of not snuggling her against his toned body. Remember that promise that I made earlier? The Neko show gave a cute nod, her eyes fluttered and again he used his self control to not let his lowly con side escape, where did that come from? Never mind. I'll show you why you caught the scent of a Neko show from me, in front of her eyes. Naruto started to change as under his bangs of hair. Two Bakaneko ears appeared, twitching a few times, and at his tailbone two Bakaneko tails grew that danced behind him. Both new appendage were hellfire blue with black strikes and at the tip of each, a small blue-black hellfire could be seen. Her eyes took everything in until it landed on his eyes that were two mismatched unique eyes of yellow and green that stared back at her. A Bakaneko, she said in awe that Naruto confirmed with a nod. Yes, one of my forms. What you see now is my lowest form of my second form, it's called Nibi and my full form is called Bakaneko. They just stared at each other as tears escaped her eyes. Our little secret. You are no longer alone, Kaneko-chan. H. Hi, Naruto-kun. Kaneko squealed lively, her eyes sparkled with life as she wrapped her arms around her new family. Together they left the room and walked out of the castle with Rias soon joining them. While they moved towards their school, Naruto, Kaneko and Rias noticed everyone staring at them until Kiba joined them and pointed out their attire. The other prince of Kuo stared at them, taking in the high quality of their attire that made them look like nobility. Naruto walked in his silk white yukata that is adorned with Tomo's markings around the end of his sleeves and around his collar. His hair danced freely in the wind and on each of his arm he held a girl, Rias Gramary and Kaneko Deju whom each wears kimono too. Rias in her pink. Sakura kimono and her hair freely fall down her back, walked with grace that caused many girls and boys to blush, and a few get some nosebleeds. Kaneko in her white kimono that mirrors Naruto's only with cat marks make them almost look like siblings with Kaneko have lighter white hair than him. What's the occasion that you walk like this? Rias giggled at Kiba and the waved her hand down along her attire. We had a night over at Naruto Kun's place. There he lent us some of his naughty collected kimonos that we now wears, and we did forget this morning to change after a wonderful meal. But if you feel jealous of us, ask Naruto if he have some for you to wear. Kiba's attention immediately shot towards Naruto that gazed him warily when he took notice of an overhyped blonde. Can I join too? It would be so awesome if I wear something like this, like a samurai. Okay, Kiba's a bit too enthusiasm for my liking, but it would be fun to see him running from his fangirl, so why not help him out? thought Naruto with a quirk and motioned Kiba to join them. The students parted for the group of the most famous students that made their way under guidance of Rias, Kaneko and Kiba to the occult research clown where Kiba could change his attire. Kiba talked excitedly about his yukata, bowing the whole way towards his shared prince of Kuo station. Naruto Senpei, thank you so much of borrowing a yukata from your naughty collection. Do you have one that follows this description? Black colored yukata with a white black yin yang mark on its back. The edges of the sleeves are richly trimmed with silver in the forms of a Chinese dragon. Naughty collection, Kiba? Who told you they're from Naughty collection? Drawled Naruto, his eyes pierced sternly at the back of Kiba's head. I don't know who told you that they came from my Naughty collection but I can assure you that they are not. And I will only lend you one of my yukata for a spar at the end of the day at the kendo club. Yuto Kiba smiled at the thought of wearing a yukata and at the end of the day a kendo match, he wondered at how skilled Naruto is with a blade as he like any kendo practitioner noticed his not so innocent stance when he stands still or when he moves that each motion is well thought with the intents of defending or a quick attack to immobilize his opponents. But also his reputation in said sport was something that he want to compete against. 
The young blonde boy and the others arrived at the old school building unlocked the doors before they entered and moved towards the club room where Kiba changed his attire. While the girls, Rias more than Kaneko talking to Naruto, Kiba's voice could be heard from behind the curtains. O Lucifer, it is the same attire of Samurai Deeper Kyo, his black yukata with the yin yang symbol on his back, came the high pitched voice of Kiba. And it feels so soft against my skin, like. Is he alright? Naruto whispered, his voice low so Kiba wouldn't hear him. Don't worry, EHM, Kiba does this all the time. Rias reassured her friend. They had decided to call Naruto a friend after a sleepover at his house. She then too lowered her voice, glancing for a second at the curtains at where her knight was changing his attire. We suspect that he bet for the other camp. Clothed pervert, Kaneko added her point from her position on Naruto's lap while leaning in against his hand that caressed her hair. She purred, her stomach felt warm as did her chest while she sits there on his lap, his warm and gentle aura caressed her whole body and the rumble of his laughter that reverberated through him caused her blush deepen. Kiba must hurry up or he will be late for class, the Oni stated and all of them left the room except for Kiba that was still drooling over the yukata. Once outside of the old school building, they met a group of girls led by Suna Shidori. Hi Suna, Rias cheered when she noticed her childhood friend and rival. Sona is a young bespectacled woman in her late teens with a slim figure, black hair styled in a short bob cut and violet eyes that stared sternly at the crimson haired devil. Don't hi me, Rias. Where were you last night? You promised me a chess match but you didn't show up. Letting me alone there waiting for you, planning a few strategies that I wanted to use on you as punishment, Sona sternly berated her friend, slightly bending through the hips as she leaned forward. One arm rested on her side while her other hand extended its index finger and jabbed with each word into Rias S, causing one the great lady's S to look up curiously. And why are you not wearing any bra? Or what is it with this traditional Japanese attire of yours? President, she is not the only one. Sona jumped up at the unexpected voice of her queen, Tsubaki Shinra. Tsubaki Shinra like her king is a young bespectacled woman with long straight black hair that extends all the way down to her knees with split bangs and light brown eyes that like her king looked stern. Both her king and her peerage are students of Kuo and wears the traditional girls' uniforms. Sona's attention glided from Rias towards the small petite girl, Kaneko that just like her rival wears another attire than Kuo's girls' uniform namely a white kimono that fits her quite nicely with her white hair and send the girl a small smile before continuing and settled on Naruto whom stands next to the petite girl. Like the other two he too wears in traditional attire for men, a yukata white in color and like Kaneko it fits him quite well that made him look like a noble from ancient Japan. What is Rias doing with Otsutsuki-san? Sona thought while she studied the tomos on his sleeves and collar. Is she planning of recruiting him or something else entirely? And how come I feel the same sacred gear from him that I felt a few days from the pervert? She looked up, retreating from her thoughts and locked eyes with Rias, once having her attention she nodded in the direction of Naruto at which her rival gave a firm nod that confirmed her suspicion, and then mouthed. It's my chance at getting a sacred gear user, at which her rival hung her head, but if he is in the companion of Rias and her peers and they came just from the old school building, does that mean he knows about us being devils? And? Woe does my eyes see this perfect? Kaneko is attached to his waist and she. She is glaring at me. Oh shit I stared too long at him. Sona broke quick her gaze from Naruto, her face a shade of red that only deepened when she noticed that her fellow devils are staring at her, especially Naruto and Kaneko whom glowered cutely at her. The Nekosho crunched her brows together, eyes turned in cat-like slits and her cute small nose wiped up while she filled her cheeks with air that just make her ten time cuter, but at the same time, and dark aura poured out of her skin wrapping around her as she hissed towards Sona. She didn't release her arms around Naruto's waist whom laughed sheepishly in her arms. W. What is it? stuttered Sona, whom could not decide to squeal or take a step back. You stared at Naruto too long. Rias giggled while Kaneko nodded fiercely. You are not helping, Rias. Sona thought. Deciding to take a step back and save herself from grace she pointed at Naruto whom blinked at her strange stance legs parted while her upper body curved backwards that pressed her round firm s higher into the air and pointed with her index finger accusingly at him while with her other hand she pushed her glasses back in place. I did not stare at Otsutsuki-san, and if I did, it is then his fault for wearing Nunkuo's attire. Who in his right mind walks in those why, revealing Yukata that shows off his perfect sculpted masculine chest, sigh. She drawled off and ended with a sigh while everyone stared at her, 
totally surprised at her blatant flirting with the most coveted male of Kuo. Rias raised her hand, covering her curling lips as she laughed. Her shoulders shook as she tried to contain her mirth but failed when it became too much and she howled. The president, Sona seeing caught up of what she had said blushed, and still in the same position she spoke in a restrained tone. I, Sona Citri challenges you to a chess game, if I win you are mine and no one will learn of what had happened here, but if you win then I am yours for all eternity. What's your answer, Otsutsuki-san? I say, he paused for a moment, gazing at her intensely before smiling mirthful at her. Is this your way of asking me out for a date? Cause for me it sounds like one. Asking a boy out by first complimenting him and then a good challenge with his price a date for eternity. The devils around Naruto face faulted, and for Sona and her queen, Tsubaki Shinra their glasses slid down to the tip of their nose while a huge sweat drop slid down the side of their heads. For the petite Nekosho, she only increased her embrace tightly around his waist, painfully and glared harder at the other devils before releasing his waist and immediately claimed his arm and pulled Naruto away from the busty menaces and the surrounding girls that were on their way towards classes that are squealing at the cute couple while the boys glared heatedly at the lucky bastard that had gained the attention of the cute small mascot. While Kaneko was marching away, stamping her feet firmly in the soil, dragging Naruto with her, Sona and the others recovered themselves from his ridiculous reply at something Sona graced at something very serious. The president glanced at her friend with a curious expression about the young man that was a moment ago with them, she wondered if he did know about them being devils, not one to walk around the bushes she asked her question. Does he know about us being devils, and can I make out from the lack of scent of him you didn't turn him yet? I didn't turn him, and you have probably already guessed that he have the sacred gear that formerly belonged to Issei. So he now have his sacred gear, how did he obtain it and does he did know that I was serious about me challenging him and what it entails? mused Sona to herself, already lost in thought as she prepared herself for her match against him, even if he didn't accept her challenges, yet. While her king was thinking of a few different ways of making Naruto hers, her queen Tsubaki Shinra meanwhile counted the peerage of Rias and found that she missed two members and asked Rias for the said missing persons. She found out where Rias Knight is, and muttered about lazy boys while marching up the old school building where later a high-pitched scream rose up from said building and the devils left the ground in haste. Everyone arrived in time in their classes and Kaneko smiled down at her box of sweets that Naruto left her before leaving for his own class not without promising that they would lunch together under the tree. Naruto arrived in time in his class, waving at a few girls and joined Rias and Akeno whom giggled at him before everyone took their seats and the time flew when the bell rang, signaling that it was lunchtime. Sounds of chairs scraping against the floor when everyone pushed back from their desks and jumped to their feet. Yes, it's lunch break time, hoo hoo. Naruto cheered excitedly, bending to pick up his bag he slung it over his shoulder and marched out of the class with Rias and Akeno following him. The group of three walked through the hallways, talking about small things. Akeno, Rias' queen had of course noticed like everyone else the traditional Japanese attire and nudged the white silver-haired boy in his side. Hey, Naruto-kun, what's the occasion that both you and Rias walks in these fine costumes, cause it fit you quite nice, and I wonder where I can get some to join. Before Naruto could answer Akino's question, Kiba joined them together with Kaneko while the first mention took upon him to answer her. Naruto Senpei got them from his naughty collection and lend me this wonderful yukata for today. Naruto's right eye twitched at the naughty comment while Akino giggled behind her hand, she inched closer and locked their arms together with his while pressing his arms deeper in her cleavage much to the ire of Kaneko and Rias. Era, era naughty collection, how naughty of you Naruto kun but I see that Kiba and Kaneko chan have joined you too, you don't mind that I join too, nay? The queen said in a sultry tone, pouting a bit while fluttering her eyelashes that earned her a blush from the oni, much to the ire of the two other girls in the group. Akeno, I am sure that Naruto will gladly lend you some kimono, so go with Kiba to our club room to change and then come join us under the Sakura tree. Rias spoke to her friend with an twitched brow, much to the amusement of Akeno whom giggled before she pulled Kiba away from the group and glanced at Naruto whom immediately was claimed by Rias and Kaneko, both grasping his arm and clutched them between their s as they continued their walk towards their picnic spot. The group stepped out of the building when suddenly a voice came from behind them. Otsutsuki Senpei. Turning around, Naruto, Kaneko and Rias looked at Issei whom had addressed Naruto. Kaneko glared with her ephetic face at him, seeing his eyes firmly locked on Rias' chest area that tried to hide her girls from his lecherous eyes. Yes, hiyodo san replied Naruto with a cool tone, what can I do for you? Issei flinched at the cool tone, 
his eyes still firmly locked on Rias S while his mind wandered off of what he would do to them. Imagines of Rias appeared in his mind, her soft full pink lips firmly locked around his shaft while she have a ed silly expression while imagines after imagines followed up with Rias in the spotlight. Drool dribbled out of his mouth much to the disgust of the group that could pretty well follow his line of thought if the motion of his hands close to his crotch was an indication and Kaneko stepped forward and swung her leg, bam. Naruto and every other male winced at the pervert that twitched on the ground after his meeting with Kaneko's leg. His eyes rolled up, his voice and throaty sound while he clutched his manhood. The three of them moved again but Issei recovered quick and sprinted towards them but tripped over his own feet and tumbled towards the small petite girl, his arms outstretched and would grasp her small, firm s if it wasn't for Naruto to extend his leg and kicked him back, saving his cute friend. He stepped menacingly forward, towering over the Issei that shrunk under his icy glare. Speaking, Naruto's voice was devoted of life or any emotion except coldness. Now, Issei before I crush you, why did you call out for me? Issei stared up at the cold gaze of the Prince of Kuo whom had somehow captured Issei's girl or that is what he believes. His eyes switched between the cold eyes of Otsutsuki Senpei and Ria's soft, round firm S and gulped when Naruto took a step closer. I, I wondered I, if you k, know anything eh, about Yuma-chan. Staring firmly into his eyes, Naruto receded his anger and spoke in a calm manner. No, I haven't seen her of late. If that was all, then I and my companions will be on our way. Issei's face fell, he was sure that Naruto knew what happened to Yuma. Somehow in the depth of his conscious he knew Naruto had lied to him. He knew what happened that night and he will find out no matter what and while finding out he will conquer Rias' lecherous body. The boy's shoulder started to tremble as he laughed at the thought of Rias bending to his will when suddenly a cold menacing aura descended upon him and he looked up to see Naruto glare at him from in distance. Jumping to his feet, Issei ran away and hide behind the tennis club to satisfying his lust-filled thoughts at the view of showering tennis players. After the confrontation with Issei, the group arrived at their destination only to notice that the president and her queen Tsubaki already on their spot with a few surprises. Under Sona and Tsubaki laid already a blanket that could easily fit seven people, including the baskets with food that they had ordered and just like Rias' group they were clothed like nobles with Sona wearing a green kimono with a soccer tree on her back and flower petals along her sleeves and Tsubaki wears a yellow kimono with cranes decorating her back. Hi, we thought we'd join you at lunch. Tsubaki welcomed them under the tree. I can see that, and might I compliment you girls that the kimono made you look beautiful. Naruto complimented them while taking a seat and Kaneko immediately claimed her place next to him, and scowled at them. Sona and Tsubaki smiled at the compliment and invited the others to take a seat while opening the basket to reveal some small package that everyone unpacked and placed in the middle of them. This scent smell good. Did you make these yourself, Sona? Sona stared at the white silver haired student and blushed slightly, yes, thank you. Everyone stick out their hands, helping to prepare everything and when they were done with placing everything on the blanket did Kiba and Akano rejoin them and the feast could start. Akano took seat next to her king while Kiba took seat next to Tsubaki whom offered him a toast with egg salad that a grateful accepted and Kaneko claimed Naruto's lap while enjoying Naruto's self-made food while he was talking to Sona sharing strategies much to Sona's surprise. The double attack, or forks, moves that attack two enemy targets at once. My favorite is the knight forks. My reason is for the wide range of targets. Then the knight is roughly comparable in value to a bishop, and so is less valuable than a rook or queen. Thus a knight not only attack any unprotected or loose enemy pieces but also can exchange favorably for enemy queens and rooks regardless of whether they have protection. Second, the knight's unique, non-straight pattern of movements creates two advantages. Sona listened to his reason why he favored the knight's fork. When Naruto started at the two advantages of knights, she took over his talk about knights. It allows a knight to attack other pieces without fear of being captured by them. And it enables a knight to make jumps and deliver threats that are surprising to the eye and so are easy to overlook. Indeed, knights are unpredictable and could change the play with a few sets. If played right, Knights can easily take out the higher pieces behind defenses. Naruto picked up again as everyone stopped talking and listened to the pair talking about the knights. Their conversation between the two strategies continued during the feast until it was time again to rejoin the classes but not without Sona getting his answer at her challenge that he accepted much to her joy, and with this in mind she retreated to her office to plot a good strategy against him. With her new pieces of information on him she knew he would not be an easy opponent and she would made sure that he would become hers. The bell rang, 
signaling the end of the day much to Naruto's relief as he made his way towards the president office with the girls and Kiba in tow to see the match between two strategies. Arriving at the office, Naruto and the others were welcomed with tea and cookies before they started their game with each other's life on the line. Several minutes passed and Sona's black pieces were stationed like this. Her pawns were placed at a6, b4, e5 and h4. Her knights were placed on c-8 and b3. One bishop and rook were placed with the first mentioned at b2 and last mentioned at a1 and with her king trapped at b8. The president looked over the board with a twitched eye, searching for a way to escape his trap as she stared at Naruto's white pieces that were stationed with his white paws on, a5, e4, g2, h3. His bishop at d5 and his rook at g7 and his last piece the king at h2, secured between his paws. Naruto had locked all her pieces by sacrificing a lot of his pieces and now he was on set. I place my rook from g7 to b7 and by this set I place your king at check. Naruto spoke coolly, an aura of power radiated from him while he gazed his pieces coldly like an overlord. Sona had never met someone like Naruto that suddenly changed from the warm, friendly person to such an cold calculating person that she now played against. Seeing no way out, Sona picked up her piece to place it on a free spot, stalling her lose. I place my king from b-8 to a8. This set of her gave Naruto a change to take out her pawn on b4 and at the same time set her king on check and gave her no other choice to set her king at a7 at which Naruto returned his rook to b7. You are highly gifted in chess, Naruto Senpei. Thank you, Sona-chan. But if you play it as long strategy games like me, then you see in a blink the holes. Then my next set will be my rook from b7 to b3 and I claim your knight. I see that I lose, but might I ask which tactic you used? Sona asked while placing her king to a minus 8 and Naruto claimed her bishop at b2. She was curious what his tactic is called. This tactic is called windmill. By limiting the opponent number of ways, I can take them out easily by placing each of my pieces. This time my bishop to set your king at check if I move my rook to claim in peace and then retreat back to move your king that only delay your demise. Thank you, I think I will remember this one for another game. Sona said while eyeing her pieces but noticed whatever she will do, she will not survive this one. Sighing lightly at the thought of losing a game but now she could set another plan of her into motion, while not strengthening her peerage, she might have won a smart, intellect and handsome husband. I surrender, you won. Congratulations. Rias, Kiba, Akano and Kaneko were stunned at how easy Naruto had defeated the president that had won many games against the Grammary heir. Sona's own queen was surprised at the effortless defeat of her king and complimented Naruto on his great game that extended his hand to Sona Sitri. Sona, it was a great game. I did enjoy it greatly and I look forward to future games between us. You did one fairly, as with me lose the challenge. Call your price. Sona smiled inwardly if her second plan will work out, then she wouldn't have to worry for any unworthy marriages. Naruto thought thoughtful one hand under his chin while staring at nothing until a small smile formed as his lips curled up. Sona Sitri, I know that you like Rias or a devil or else you didn't challenge me. I too am from the supernatural world and I need allies. Allies that support me 100%, and I want you to be someone that I can trust. A smile graced all the devils in the room. Sona smirked inwardly. Checkmate, Naruto Koi. Consider it done, Naruto Kun. The two shook their hands while gazing each other up and smiled at the new friendship and alliances. Outside of Kuo, clothed in black cloaks that hide his face from view stared down at the gathered students that left Devil's School. The person's crimson eyes glowered at the sight of all those disgusting humans, but his eyes searched for one special person that he finally spotted behind the swimming club building and a smirk graced his face. Stretching out his black wings and slammed them down that pulled him into the air while flying above the boy while dropping a card behind the unsuspected boy that peeked at the girls that were showering while he held in his hand his tool. Let's see what he is capable of with power, thought the mysterious person before vanishing in black feathers as his laughter reverberated through the air, sending chills down everyone's spine and Issei looked up in panic at being caught again at peeking at the girls. Deep down below the old abandoned church, Five dark cloaked figures had gathered in the old, clam dusty basement. The walls were covered by dust. In the corners were large spider webs within each a giant spider that watched the gathered mysterious people with their eight crimson eyes as they crawled higher into their webs. The cold, 
Frosty wind howled through the halls and through the room and flickered the flames of the candles high above them that are firmly placed in medieval chandeliers that casted in ghostly light against the walls and the lower part of the gathered cloaked figures that each took a seat around an oval black table with an skull at the center at which a candle stuck at that gave off an emerald light. Fresh blood dripped down from the chandelier and into the basin beneath a fresh core of a young woman with black hair and pain striking eyes that stared into nothingness. Her chest was pierced by one of the sharp ends of the chandelier and the mythical figures beneath her laughed at her struggle as her body twitched, her lips parted as blood seeped out of the corner of her mouth as she let out an high-pitched howl. Welcome. Welcome to our first gathering here in Kuo, in Devil's Territory. A man stands at the head end of the oval black, marble table. His features were covered by a deep cap that obscured his face with only crimson eyes that flared in the darkness. This man, a fallen and a believer in chaos spread his arm high above his head and lifted up his face to gaze at the dying woman. Tonight. Tonight we have a guest that honors us with her presence. Dark chuckles escaped the gathered people as it reverberated through the dusty, cold basement and up the stairs where a shadow glided silently towards the group but stayed out of sight. The man once again demanded his fellow cloaked figure's attention. She is a yukai, and creature of chaos, death, lust and all that we stand against but she will give us a last farewell gift. The gathered people stared all at him, their leader and one of them slammed its fists against the surface of the dark, unholy table as his lips curled up into a menacing, devil-like grin. His dark crimson eyes and slight white bangs that peeped out from under his cap started to chant, War, 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 war. Soon the rest followed as the young woman was lowered to the table and roughly pulled off the chandelier that held a firm grasp on her chest before it with a sickening tearing sound parted from her while she let out an inhuman scream that only those that are banished to Tartarus could rival. More demoniac and raving laughter echoed up the stairs and out of the entryway of the old, abandoned church with the accompanied high-pitched screams of the young woman as crimson light now radiated from the surface of the black surface. A line crawled over the surface that stretched out and on different points it turned and curved as it splits and each crimson line took its own path. While the cloaked figures watched the crimson lines connect with each other, forming different layers of circles. Others formed ancient symbols that were lost through the ages but some recognized them at which the leader was one of them. The woman's body was now convulsing uncontrollable as foam with blood escaped her lips, her eyes rolled up and her arms raised up and took the same position as the once holy son did eons ago on the cross when he was punished for the human's faults. All eyed the woman as a young man stepped forwards and ripped off her clothes from her shivering body as the leader started to speak in an ancient ritual. The young man grinned demonical as he proceeded to the woman's legs and parted them while she now shuddered so hard that she fell almost from the surface of the ritual circle. I am going to enjoy breaking your virginity. The leader continued chanting while the young man released his beastly urges and penetrated deeply into her as her body fell lifeless, her eyes staring into nothingness while her arms reached out towards the skull and her hands grasped around the candle that she pulled out, slowly. Clang. The blade was released with a loud clang as it now was grasped tightly in the woman's hands as she lifted her arm higher and higher while her body took the beating from the man that reshaped her genitals while candle fat drooped over her heavy, firm round S and her S burned and her skin turned red when it fell on her. Candle light flickered from the crimson blade in her hand as it descended down and into her chest as she cut it open and with an horrifying scream she ripped her skin apart, revealing her beating heart. The unholy blade fell out of her hand, on the surface beside her and dangled dangerously over the edge before it lost its fight against gravity and descended to the dirty floor and with a loud clatter it fell on the dusty ground. Now, drink. The crimson-eyed leader commanded in his cold, gruff voice when he finished his ritual chanting as the woman lifted off the basin from the surface on common and brought it to her lips while the crazy, white-haired young man continued ravaging her body. With large gulps she drank her own blood and her heart started to radiate an emerald light that brightened with each swig of the basin as her blood now escaped the corner of her lips while her eyes now rolled back up into her head as the leader hand shot out and grasped the unholy, demonical artifact from the woman's chest as the emerald. Radiating heart continued beating while he secured it in a small, crimson chest with an evil grin plastered on his lower part of his face. After some time he still stared at his crazy companion that continued ravaging the now deaf woman's body. And you can stop, now. A nervous, menacing chuckle escaped the crazy cloaked man while he dismounted the young woman and secured his tool. He took his place back around the table and stared at his leader, a thin, wide smirk appeared on his face. Nothing beaten woman in a demonic ritual, he he he. I can't wait until our new guests will appear here, and I can bet that none is a screamer. But what did you get out of this ritual? I got a demonic artifact that will serve us well in our cause. 
replied his leader. His lean, thin fingers touched the girl's soft neck and trailed his fingers down to the valley of her s while breathing harshly. His crimson orbs rested for a moment on her lifeless body before light radiated from his fingers and the body burned up, turning to dust. When he spoke, he earned his followers' attention once again. My friends, tonight we are one step closer to our goal. Tonight we gained a new unholy, demonical artifact that would tremble the foundation. Here is our first key to release the beast of chaos but while we work towards our goal, there are those that are against us. Insults and outraged screams echoed from the walls, showing at how they feels to those that dared to stand in their ways. Their leader let them continue their cries of outrages and insults before he reined them in with a whip of black lightning that halted them and each one of them gazed up to him. Yes, there are beings that could cause us trouble, one of them are the satans that are against our goals, another faction are the angels of our esteemed father that cares more about those low life that he called humans than us, their brother and sisters and cast us out of our home, and then we have the followers of Azazel the fool. The gnashing of teeth, and fingers could be heard as cold eyes firmly looked up to their leader that only smirked at them. And a few days ago a new unexpected player has joined this game of chaos. This person appeared after I had ordered one of my servants to take care of an sacred gear user, sadly she failed. Not only survived the meat bag but he too lost his only change of power and this sacred gear is now in the hands of an unexpected creature, an oni. Tisk, an oni. What can those lowlife do against us? scoffed one of his followers. Their factions are nothing more than a small group that are waiting for the slaughter. Only that cursed whore called Yusaka blocks each of our changes of slaughtering them all. This Oni might be more than you think. He blocked easily the destructive powers of the Gramary heiress when he stole the Meebag's sacred gear and claimed it for his own. Spoke their leader once more while everyone listened to him. This Oni is easily six feet tall, and a few inches of four more. He has white silver spiky hair and blue white flower pattern like eyes. After he had stolen the sacred gear he and the Grammary heiress started in conversation at which he declined her peerage. With him declining her we might have a change of recruiting him and with him gaining the Yukai faction, if not then the Yukai faction and him will be crushed under our might. I don't see why you want an worthless Oni join our cause but what about our agent in hell? Is he prepared for our feast of the beast as without a girl marrying and being of the underworld, we can't gain our third demonic artifact after vernal equinox sacrifice that will happen over three days. Don't worry, he is ready. If I am right he will visit our dear devil soon, muahahaha. High-pitched, demonical laughter joined their leader as it reverberated through the basement, up the stairs as the shadow that had listened to their madness left together with the sound that now was lifted up into the air and through the roof as black wings spread out her back and her black hair danced in the wind. Her mission was complete and now she need to inform her higher-ups of this mysterious leader's upcoming rituals. The 18th of May Two days prior to Vernal Equinox, Kuo Academy. I sang of leaves, of leaves of gold, and leaves of gold there grew. Of wind I sang, a wind there came, and in the branches blew. Beyond the sun, beyond the moon, the foam was on the sea. And by the strand of Ilmarin there grew a golden tree. A clear and melodious voice echoed through the darkness. To those that listened to this lilting voice felt like they lived living inside the song that slowly was sung in the background. At the ethereal melodious command, a tree grew golden leaves while the wind played with its branches and carried its seed in them through the forests until they were over the cliffs to see the sea at where the seed landed and grew into a golden tree. Beneath the stars of Ever Eve in Eldamar it shone. In Eldamar beside the walls of Elventirion, there long in the golden leaves have grown upon branching years. And there beyond the sundering seas now fall the elven tears. Unique eyes fluttered open. His arms moved elegantly through the air while his legs moved as he danced through the trees with the sounds of the seas behind him while a golden leaf floated down before him and he balanced on one feet with his other risen up, high into the air. O oh Lorian! The winter comes, the bare and leafless day. The leaves are falling in the stream, the river flows away. O oh Lorian! Too long I have dwelt upon this hither shore. And in a fading crown have twined the golden Eleanor. But if of ships I now would sing, what ship would come to me? What ship would bear me ever back across the wide sea? The Sanger finished his song as he kneeled and the light that basked him died down, leaving the room entirely in shadows until clapping sounds cut through the darkness that soon were followed by cheers and whistles from his audience, filling the drama club room when the illusion was lifted up when his voice died down. Naruto rose up and rubbed the back of his head while a smile adorned his face. Shizuka Nekonome advisor of the drama club was stunned at the perfect performance. 
She stared at the Prince of Kuo with slack jaws while her hair tweaked that suspiciously looked like cat ears. She is a young woman with light blonde hair, spectacles adorning her face that increased her cuteness as her sapphire eyes radiated with stars. When Nekonome Sensei recovered she vanished in a flash and was fined on Naruto's arm, clutching tightly his arm that she rubbed affectional much to the ire of a certain white-haired girl that had watched his performance. Nekonome Sensei purred when she spoke to her non-member of the drama club. That was perfect, Naruto-kun. I did not know that you were so talented in singing. She clutched his arm deeper in her perfect round, firm globes that desired to eat his arm while a pair of girls twitched rapidly their right eye. There is much you still not know about me, Shizuka-chan. The white-haired young man replied with lilt in his voice to Nekonome sensei as he brought his lips closer to her ears, his breath graced her ears that caused her to shiver as she let out a low purr moan and she released progesterone that a certain Nekosho caught with her sensitive nose. But I know what you are, Shizuka Nekonome the Nekomata. Shizuka Nekonome froze at what he said, and she paled further when he continued, Don't be scared, I keep your little secret between us. But a word of advice, this school is crowded with devils. W. What? I. I didn't know that, what must I do? Shizuka whispered. Her voice adopted an anxious tone while her hair twitched nervously. She tightened her grip around his arm that sunk deeper between the valley of her remarkable S. Don't be afraid, Shizuka-chan. I can help you, but can you release my arm, while I love the feeling? I can't help to be afraid of my cute furry, N.D., Naruto panicky pronounced as he noticed Kaneko marching up to him with burning eyes and yelped in an high-pitched unmanly voice when Kaneko's soft delicate fingers closed around his sensitive organs and dragged him over the floor to the exit of the drama club. There at the entryway she glanced over her shoulder back to Nekonome sensei with a withering glare before Naruto and she vanished from the drama club with Naruto's high-pitched screams echoed through the halls that made the boys wince and clutching their own. Not my balls, please, Kaneko-chan. I still need them for baby making, Kaya. Half an hour later we could find Kaneko and Naruto in the occult research club. Our Neko show had claimed Naruto's lap whom winced in pain while Kaneko shifted her small, delicate cheeks against his tortured balls while she had a satisfied smile on her face. The two sits now on Kaneko's former spot that now is baptized and named Kaneko and Naruto's spot at which the first Mentione one arms wrapped Naruto's arm around her waist as she leaned her head against his shoulder while watching her bucko staring nervously at the calendar from time to time, and certain date was marked with skulls, coffin and curses. Kaneko turned her head to glance over her shoulder to look her crush firmly into his eyes. You and me, over two days a date. She demanded in her usual stoic tone and stolen from him that left him stunned and a victorious small smirk flashed on her lips before she returned her attention back to Rias that now mumbled about that date, missing the whole scene. Recovering from his unannounced demand of an date and his pain in his testicle and now enjoyed the soft, firm cheeks of his cute mascot that shifted again, clearly enjoying her new toy if the pressing of her cheeks were any indication, she purred at the warm, hard long tool that sunk a bit deeper between her cheek. Once again, Kaneko spoke in her ephetic voice but she didn't need that as her eyes told him volumes at Naruto's reason of being at the drama club. Naruto. Why were you there at the drama club? The mentioned boy gazed amusingly at the girl that now stared at him again with a gaze that said if I don't found it a good reason, you'll find yourself seven feet under the earth threat. Chuckling lightly at her threat that only intensify her gaze at him and her hands sneaked down towards his, gulping in fear for his poor, poor manhood that he likely want to use in the future maybe paying this naughty Nako back and let her scream his name while he ravaged her, that though caused his tool to grow dangerously under the Neko show that arched an elegant white brow at him before she shifted again her butt, planting it more firmly between her cheek. Talk Naruto Koi, or else you will never use this, monster. Kaneko's eyes widened when she felt it grew a few inches more. T. That thing W. Will N. Never fit. Thought the Neko show in slight fear, and slight heat as a slight blush crept up her face. All right, I'll talk, I don't want to be separated with little Naru-chan. It all started this morning when I entered Kuo's school ground. My feet were moving at their own, pulling me along the way until my ears caught giggles from out the bushes. Curiously I stealthily moved towards the source while on my way I met Murayama and Kates from the Kendo Club. Each were in the possession of their shinai that were aimed at the bushes where we found the infamous hentai Sanananggumi, that were feasting themselves on the drama club girls that were changing. They stands at boxes to glance through the window above while one of them kept a watch out but was too busy to join them at which we used the opportunity to beat the crap out of them. 
Our small commotion caught the attention of the drama club and Shizuka Nekanome came to look what caused the disturbance. Of course Sensei was grateful and asked me to join them while the kendo club declined and I was at the point of declining too when she suddenly used the forbidden technique. Kawaii Kaneko no me. It defeated me and that's how I ended up at the drama club. Fine I would have known about Kawaii Kaneko no me. The young Nekosho sighed but a small smile played on her lips at her discovery of his weakness, so she decided to reward him by patting him on the head, twice. Naruto pouted at her patting that she saw and smirked while grabbing his hand, guiding it to her head and planted it firmly with a pointing look that transformed to his newest dreadful weakness, Kawaii Kaneko no Mi. And he did what she desired, patting her head that brought out slight purrs, borderline quiet moans while she rolled her hips along his lap that caused him to growl feral at her lap dance. A squeak suddenly cut through the air when the door slammed open and the two devils entered the room. Akano and Kiba walked in as each of them took a seat on a leather sofa. This was then that Rias Grammary heiress of Grammary notices that she the whole time was not alone, and that the person that caused her plans in ruin sits here in her club room, hiding behind her cute devil. Her piercing blue-green stared straight through Kaneko towards the person of the cause of her misery. The one that took away her sacred gear user, her ticket away from that stupid, unwelcome contract and she knows exactly how to rectify that. Naruto. Rias called in an eerie, ghostly voice. Her hair somehow, like that of his second mother defied gravity as it flew up behind her in ten tails while black miasma leaped out of her and her once blue-green eyes turned crimson and flared anomalous and then a creepy laugh escaped her lips. Her fingers bailed together, forming a fist that she slammed down on her desk that groaned under her powerful hit as spider webs appeared on the surface while three pair of eyes all glided towards Naruto. The young man in question wondered what he had done wrong to earn the ire of the Crimson Ruin Princess and he felt Kaneko inches away from him, much to his fear. Kaneko! Don't leave me! cried the Oni while the earth shook with each step that Rias took towards him. An eerie laugh filled the room, and that laugh came from Rias. Kaneko-chan will not come to your aid, Naruto. You, Oni you're all on your own cause we have some business that still must be finished Kukakuku. Hi, Rias chan Naruto called out confused at. You owe me in sacred gear, Naruto, Rias crimson bangs obscured her face but it left her wide, crazy smile behind that scared him a bit. She now stands in front of him, her fingers grasped his collar and lifted him into the air and shook him furiously. You owe me a sacred gear. If you didn't intervene after that battle and let that pervert die then I would have a sacred gear user that could be used to get me out of this mess that I am in now, thanks to you. What kind of mess? came Naruto's confused question, and why is it my fault at all? It's none of your business, jerk. It is your fault that I am now trapped in this contract, something that I wish never happened to me but now I might live a miserable life. All. Thanks. To. You. Naruto. Rias' volume increased with each word passing her pink lips while shaking the white-haired, poor prince of Kuo but I can rectify that, I make you join my peerage, prepare yourself. No, silence fell at the blunt decline of Naruto that gazed sternly at the devil, what did you say? You heard me, I said no, meaning I won't join your peerage, I won't turn into a devil, I will not become someone's chess piece. His voice was calm, low and in control, me joining your peerage will not solve your issue. And even if you did gain that human within sacred gear, who could assure you that it was an offensive gear, medical gear, Defensive gear or just a worthless gear with nothing special and you would have wasted a peace item. After all, he is just a human. No special powers except for the sacred gear that he lost. Unlike Yuto Kiba that might have a messenger of the Holy Father as his predecessor that gave him the ability to use what the angels did and became what he is now or like the Greek gods, he is an demigod. Rius was stunned, she had never thought about her decisions like that. What would happen once she had her sacred gear user at which she didn't know what it could do? If she had resurrected that human and its sacred gear was nothing offensive, defensive or medical then she had used an evil piece for nothing. In the distance she could hear Naruto just mercilessly marched forward, continuing his speech. But if you succeeded in resurrection him, which pieces would you have used? An knight, enchanting his agility and speed. Or an bishop, increasing his magical powers but humans don't have any source of magical reserves. Or an rook, increasing his strength but he a mere boy. Human certainly would be a little boost in strength. Or did you just make him an pawn, knowing that a mere human never could reach the potential of all your other pieces that were trained or had special gifts to increase their powers and ability? Crimson hair lowered themselves, Naruto's feet touched the floor while Rias sunk to her knees. 
tears making their way down her beautiful face while she buried her face into his lap. The boy gently caressed her head. He wasn't mad of her, what he felt was slight pity but he let her cry until she had calmed herself a bit. Rhea's peerage sighed, glad that Naruto spoke some sense into her as all of them did not look forward to Issei joining them. But now a new problem rose up, what could they do to save their bucko from her horrifying fate? All eyes turned to Naruto that unsurprisingly looked cold, calculating and they could see his gears work to formulate a plan. Somewhere in the village, jet black feathers fluttered down from the sky as the powerful beats of wings thundered through the air and seconds later the sound soft touch of someone touching the ground. Violet eyes roamed her surrounding before a brief smile appeared on her angelic face and she pushed the door open and slipped through the entrance, gliding through the large halls. The walls were massive stones. Dating from the Shogun period with painting hanging on the walls until she paused at a wall with a candle next to a painting of Oda Nobunaga the One-Eyed Dragon. Lord Azazel have watched too much old Dracula movies, or Harry Potter if he came up with this secret candle doorway. Chuckled Rainair while she wrapped her fingers around the candle and the images of the young Yukai girl flashed through her mind. Hastily she released the candle and moved through the secret passage and descended down the stairs, she sighed once deeply as another thought came up. Why? Why in Holy Father's name must it be another basement? Maybe Father forgave me and is this basement not crowded with those creepy eight-eyed spiders? Damn those creatures gives me the chill. Rainair reached the last step and walked through a light dim tunnel that she followed for a full fifteen minutes until it arched up and she stepped in a small chapel that basked in the light of the candle light, and there at the third row was a man with black hair and his bangs were dyed blonde while he sucked on a lollipop that paired nicely with his crimson long jacket. Rainair is that you? came the drawled voice of her leader, Azazel. Azazel turned his head to glance over his shoulder to take a good look of his spy. Anything interesting to report? The fallen took a seat at the first row, her violet eyes focused on a painting of her father that extended his hand towards his child, and human. She could or will never understand why her father was so fond of human. They are tainted beyond belief. Cursed with greed, lust and power hunger, gladly they have a short lifespan. Sighing once more. She looked up and looked at Azazel. Interesting, interesting, of course I have or else I would not be here. She spoke in an haughty voice, eyeing her leader for any reaction. But to her dismay, her boss expression stayed blank. Seeing that she could not bring any facial expression from her boss, she started her report. While the group is still shrouded in mystery, I know that they have obtained one of their goals, an emerald heart fresh from a Yukai young woman through a barbaric method of sacrifice. It radiated powers beyond my imagination but I fear that if the Yukai faction will find out, they will march to war with the intent of killing them. Azazel nodded. That is indeed troublesome. But this is not the last of rituals. On the 20th of May, they will hold vernal equinox with a nun as their sacrifice. I fear for her. I have seen this ritual and it is worse than the rituals that the humans used in medieval. They are planning of breaking her mentally before doing the same to her body, please we need to stop that Azazel. I understand, now continue and then we can plan about rescuing the young woman. It's a girl, Asia Argento. Sorry, my bad, he apologized with a blank look but all humor vaporized from his voice when she told him that it was a young girl. The lollipop in his mouth broke as he gnashed his teeth together and counted mentally down to calm himself. Continue. Rainer smiled slightly when she noticed the harsh voice of the strongest fallen. She knew that he would order her after this meeting to save the young nun. Deciding to finish this meeting as quick as she could she continued. While they were planning on how they would use the young nun, they unknowingly informed me that they had an ally in the underworld that prepared himself for an another sacrifice that they called the Feast of the Beast. Crack. Azazel wings slammed wildly around him, destroying rows of benches at which the pieces flew through the space of the room. His features a mask of fear, rage and disgust. His lips tinned, barring his teeth while the floor beneath him showed spider webs like cracks. Shit! How could they gather those items? roared the fallen as his voice crashed against the walls at which Rainer cowered behind the altar, protecting herself from flying wood. Are they planning to? He suddenly calmed himself, breathing heavily while looking at her subordinate. Finish your report and then you must go in search for the young nun. Protect her at all costs. Rainer nodded. Violet eyes determined in completing her mission. She would save her, save this nun that once helped her in her time of need. Filling her lungs she continued her report. The leader then mentioned about a new player in town. Someone that had claimed himself to be an Oni, and being that was mentioned before the time of father. 
Some of members of the group scoffed at the idea of adding him while others were surprised at his skills of erecting a shield that could resist the Gremory Heiress power of destruction. That's all the information known about this new player. Azazel paled at the thought of an Oni signed in Kuo. They might not have known about what an Oni could do, but the myths at what they could do is devastating. According to the myths, Oni and Yukai came from the Garden of Eden that God created but somehow he knew that somewhere in the past something happened that caused them to roam the world. Something he needs to find out and quick. Sighing mentally while he thought about how peaceful it first was. If an Oni is signed, here in this region, could that be the sign of something that is in connection with the beast is what I knows now, a group is preparing all the rituals to free him. I need to find this Oni to see for myself if he is willingly to help me. Plans, I need a plan and maybe, Azazel mentally talked to himself while glancing at Rainair. She could be useful to make contact with this Oni. Maybe he lives there in that castle that once belonged to an powerful clan, Otsutsuki. Troublesome. You know your order, save her and protect her while I search for help. It is too dangerous now to call for other fallen as I do not know which side they have chosen. Try to find this Oni, call for his help as they are powerful beings that they will think twice to attack. I in the meantime will call the Satans for a future meeting about this troublesome events that happens beneath our nose. Rainair listened to her leader that vanished in a pale light that she followed sweet. Don't worry Asia, I will protect you with my life. I own you that. Kuo Academy, there are different ways of escaping marriage contracts. I escaped mine by challenging that dumb former fiancé of mine for an raiding game with as reward my freedom. Now I can understand you had the same idea like me but there is indifferent. Your peerage is nothing close to mine as mine have no trouble with using their full strength while yours have each their own trouble. Sona Citri explained sternly to her best friend. Her spectacle rested on the tip of her cute small nose. Violet eyes gazed firmly into hers as she sits behind her desk. Her chin rested on her hands. You. Rias threw my advice back into my face when you tried to recruit that pervert. I am glad that Naruto kun intervened by stealing its sacred gear as it would only be a waste of an evil piece. I. I already got a storm from Naruto. I don't need yours to add to it. Rias meekly tried to say between the storming words of her friend. She regretted saying a thing caused the storm turned into an hurricane as she cowered in her seat. Yeah, not enough. What did you do to find out what Naruto's sacred gear could do, hmm? Nothing? You did do nothing to find out as only in your mind was one thing. Escaping that damn marriage that narrowed your thought process. You would have bed Naruto if that was a change to escape it but let us find a way for you to escape as I have said enough. Ria's peerage and her sighed in relief when the storm died down. Naruto was calmly eating his Pocky that Kaneko tried to steal from him until a thought came up in her mind and she nibbled on the Pocky stick that stuck out of his mouth until their lips met. She repeated this process a few times until there were no Pocky sticks left. Fishing out a new pack, Kaneko joined in again with a crimson face as she purred. And you two, stop hogging each other lips. We have work to do. Sona berated the two Pocky lovers with an twitching right eye. She would remember this to use when Naruto and she are alone in her office and maybe she could do that. Images of her doing things on her desk that was improper for words. Blushing up in storm she hastily slammed a thick, large book on her desk and scanned through the pages, trying to remove those naughty thoughts. Breaking from his pocky, Naruto addressed the crimson beauty. Rias can you tell me what kind of person this devil is that marry Rias in the near futu? Our his question was interrupted by Kaneko placing another pocky stick into his mouth before nibbling to reach her reward. While it was Rias turn to pick up in storm. That bastard is an arrogant, aggressive playboy with an holier-than-thou personality, tonguing two of his girls as if they are objects. He is also condescending towards lower-class devils or any kind that are not devils. Also he likes to rub it into your face with his so-called honorable feeling and then crush it in your face. Rias hissed angrily while black miasma escaped her body. Only because he comes from the house of Phoenix, and clan that according to legends are descendants of the Phoenix with some abilities worthy of their names. But that made them all arrogant, except for Ravel and her parents that made this contract. That's an unique way of painting your in laws. An arrogant fiance plus arrogant clan, with the exception of Ravel and her parents. But there is something that nag at me a thought that this so called marriage is nothing more than a farce to obtain something. Why you ask? Seeing all the attentions turn to him, once again, Rias, Sona, Kaneko, and the others noticed that his eyes started to radiate power gaining a cold look with even cold calculations. I am suspicious about this marriage because of this date, 24 of March, Feast of the Beast that means on that date, and young girl becomes the bride of an devil in a marriage ceremony. 
It could be in coincidence. Sona tried but was shot down by Naruto immediately. Coincidence, don't think so, Sona-chan. Let us see it why I think so. First Rias is in search for a strong peerage member, someone that could help her out and then out of nowhere a sacred gear user appears. Weak as he is human but it is the sacred gear that count. He was targeted by an fallen angel only because of what he possess, but is that so? It could be that they wished you, Rias to recruit him then he is secured in your peerage, a king trapped in an unwanted marriage to someone that sees his bride as an object with two sacred gears holders. So, tell me if my thought process sounds far-fetched. Then let me continue. I can feel through my sacred gear another weak connection with another one that becomes stronger with each minute's passing. Meaning, a second sacred gear user is arriving in town, just in time for another special date, 20 of March Vernal Equinox. A feast day of orgies but above all and sacrifice, so where is the coincidence? I don't know, but we need more information to find out what this all means, and how you explained that Rias' marriage was more than it looks like, we must think for the worst. Let us now consult the law books of the devils to find a way for Rias to escape this nightmare. Sona spoke, her guts felt like someone had stomped on it with all the information that Naruto brought them. Opening her book she found quick an answer, maybe a bit drastic but an answer nonetheless. Clearing her throat to gather their attention, Sona read, on paragraph 138 of Devil's Law. In medieval time when the humans worshipped the Holy Father and the fallen son Lucifer, the latest one in fear cause he stole many brides on days before the marriages. This not only stays with humans, but he could do this to devils and angels too. Using the ancient ritual of procreation, he claimed the virginity, souls and hearts of the women that he took. It is not only the devils that do this, so do the Yukai to secure their rewards of stealing women. The ritual is so ancient that most have forgotten, but if it happens to the woman, she is bound for eternal to the devil. Everyone stared at the page at where Lucifer consummate his kidnapped wife. The wife had a bloated stomach, her s were firmly grasped by the devil that stuck out his tongue while taking her from behind while a smaller devil crawled out of her vagina. Rias paled at the thought of Riser doing something like that to her, she took steps back, her mind eyes seeing herself in that position with that monster behind her. No, please. I don't want a future like that. Bucko is right, I don't wish her something like that. We must find something else. Kiba gritted out, picking a book from its case and flipped through it. The others followed sweet, each taking a book to search for something until Kiba's voice called out to the others. Ladies, gentlemen, I think I have found something worthwhile. Everyone stood up to join him as he started to read. On paragraph 389 of Devil's Law, and marriage contract can be broken when one of two that are mentioned in the contract declines the other's hand at the ceremony. This can only occur when there is proof founded that there is ill will playing in the marriage, this ill will can be, intention of letting his or her partner's house dying out of a noble house. Use her as an breeding object or marry her with the intention of steal her of his wealth, possession and title. If the above mentioned are proved true, he or she could break the marriage and claim legislation for the mentioned above. That sound a little better. But I don't think Riser has some dark, evil plan of letting the Gremory family die out. Akano thought aloud, disgust was heard when she called out that scum's name. But on the other side, I think he gladly would do something like that. Rias, do you have a younger brother or sister? Naruto asked the Gremory heiress. No, I am the only heiress of the Gremory house, my brother took the title of Lucifer and can't claim the title for his second child. Rias told him at which she noticed that he once more was in deep thoughts. Naruto, what are you thinking? After some quiet time, Naruto gathered his thoughts and shared. I thought about what you said. If you are the last with no younger brother or sister, then you are your house last heiress that will marry with someone that, and please correct me heaven say in naming your child. He can easily claim his child as his without your family name joining the child, making it a pure phoenix child, and in result cause your family die out. At what I made out from your describing your future fiancé, he is someone that sees his house and himself as someone illustrious above all others and would gladly let your family vanish from the history page. Then, what will his house gain with the Gremory house vanishing? Another seat in the council, more power and Gremory's territories adding to their own. Sona answered as Rias was frozen at the thoughts of what could happen if she marry that scum. The spectacled girl studied her love interest, seeing the rude, cold intelligence and approved of him becoming her husband more than ever. I notice you have some experience in this branch with the way you talks about. I might have, admitted the Oni without any shroud of shame. And I can see you have already formulated a plan in dealing with her problem. Something I can help maybe? Sona adopted an husky tone, 
she turned really on with the way how Naruto calculated everything as she prowled towards Naruto and leapt to him. A pair of feral eyes narrowed at her, hissing angrily but she knew she could not do harm to her, much to her annoying. Please, let me help you. Naruto felt he long, slender fingers tracing his jawline, her soft lips that planted themselves on his collarbone, as it sucked and left a mark behind. Her hips rolled against his, tauntingly and teasing his boner that dared to look up and poked against her covered slit. I, I might age, have an, NPLA, in. Please, tell and I might reward you tonight. Whispered Sona in his ear, her breath ghosted against his soft, sensitive skin while she pressed her s against his chest, next to them. Kaneko glared at her, her nails grew and her eyes turned more feral-like. I'll tell you later tonight, I need to go. Naruto hastily said while wringing himself out from under her that caused her to moan wantonly as he brushed against her now sensitive slit in S. Finally escaping her warm, womanly body he jumped to his feet at which Kaneko immediately latched on him. Where are you going, Naruto? Sona mewled eyely. Infiltration and gathering of proof replied the oni immediately and left with Kaneko the president's office. Sauntering through the hallways with Kaneko beside her, he looked left and right before throwing Kaneko on his back, giving her a piggyback ride as he ran out of school. Kaneko, I felt a disturbance a few minutes ago that came through my sacred gear, I need your help in securing the safety of this person. Hi, Naruto Koi, Kaneko pumped her fist in the air as she enjoyed her ride on Naruto's back. Unknowingly, dark powers were starting to stir and our heroes were on the good path to save damsels in distress. Somewhere else, some distance from them, and fallen and nun were fighting for their lives. The dark-haired beauty defense the young nun that prayed for help, would help come or will they fall? Kuo's sky, dark blue in color that slowly shifted towards to yellow-orange while the sun hide itself behind the mountains. Basking the village in an eternal golden light that casted long shadows down the streets at where we could find a young girl walking down a path that would lead her to one of the many small parks that Kuo is rich of. Standing at the crossroad, we could have a better look at the young girl with long blonde hair and brilliant green eyes that radiated some kind of innocence. Her hair flows all the way down to her back, with a split bangs over her forehead and a single strand sticking out from the top, sloping backwards. She was well known in the world of Christianity for her ability to heal any illness. Her name Asia Argento though was hailed as the holy priestess by the church. Asia Argento wears the familiar church attire that consists of a dark teal nun outfit with light blue accents, a white veil over her head with light blue accents, a brown satchel slung on her right hip at where she holds her Bible, and brown boots with black straps in an X-shaped pattern. She also wears a silver cross necklace around her neck. She tilted her head to see the street signs above her that were written in strange patterns that made her green eyes whirl. Mo. I cannot read this, Asia pouted in a cute way. Why did Father Michael send me away? Glancing around, Asia looked for something that looked like an church. Taking a few steps away from the crossroad she glanced around, her eyes roamed the edge of the houses until she noticed an ancient castle atop of an hill that clearly towered out. Her bright green eyes lighted up at the unique ancient building of Himeji Castle and her curiosity got the upper hand as she skipped towards the castle with a bright smile while she giggled despite the looming shadows above her that circled around her like large predatory birds. Maybe I can from see there the church that Father Michael told me, she giggled innocently, oblivious that she was sent to Kuo in Japan as a mean of sacrifice all because her kind heart had helped and fallen angel not so long time ago. Her former home called her the witch behind her back instead of the holy priestess that had helped them so much by her unique gift of healing that was now seen as a curse as it could heal fallen angels that have fallen out of grace and they suspect she could heal devils too. A kind worst then fallen and she was sent to Kuo to free themselves from her. Several feet above the position of the new arrived young nun, several fallen floated in sky their presence covered by the thick clouds as they watched her. Some feet away from his brethren, a middle-aged looking man with short black hair and dark blue eyes gazed with a deranged smile at the nun. His pale violet trench coat billowed in the wind while he held his fedora in his black gloved hand. Look at her, so innocent, so pure. The fallen middle-aged looking man rasped to his comrades. For now, later she will just be like that Yukai slut. One of his comrades joined him. Each one of them took their position around him, forming a circle as small flashes of light came out of their palms, taking different shapes and molding in their owner's weapons that looked like spears, swords, shield or in combination of them. The fallen with the violet trench coat shrugged his shoulders, not caring about the ritual at the moment. His mind was at the thought of an upcoming battle that soon will be taken place between them and the devils or them with this mysterious oni being. 
That is what we call spoiled of war, Kane. The first man rasped while whirling his blue light spear in his hand. A deranged smile ruined his once good looking face while he brought his tongue along the flat side of his spear. Those Yukai factions are weak, it is only because of that whore that they still exist. I have heard that the whore have a daughter. A cute thing that just begs to be molded in an experienced street whore. Kane chuckled darkly. His dark bangs framed his face, covering his crazy eyes that gleamed at the thought of taking the great Kitsune's daughter. But why thinking about that whore's child while a soft, wet cunt from a nun is waiting for us to claim, ne Donaseek? Well said Kane. Donaseek roared, bringing up his black wings before he slammed them down powerful that caused his brethren to be pushed aside while he dived to earth, to his prey that innocently stared in the glass. Donaseek facial expression was one that belonged to the infamous Jack the Ripper with his small pupils, small tinned lips curled up in a deranged smile while he bared his teeth as the wind rippled his face. Once appearing behind her in black feathers that danced around her, he leaned over the nun's shoulder as the glass now reflected his maniacal face with deranged smile playing on his lips as he whispered. I know something that tastes much, much tastier. Green eyes scanned the many different kind of food that was listed on the menu that stands behind the glass of the small restaurant that displayed the mentioned food in dummies. Watering at all the different, good-looking food she pressed her cheek against the glass, trying to press herself through the object that separated her. Come here, I want to eat, Asia murmured dreamingly before she cut herself off when she felt the gentle air turn cold, dark as if all happiness is taken away. And then came the black feathers, falling slowly out of the sky with a hypnotism light blue light around the edges. She pushed herself off the window and her green eyes still looked at the glass where a face doomed up. What looked at her through the reflection of the glass was an face that belonged to the devil, a wide deranged smile played on his lips its eyes cold with a glimpse of cruelty as he whispered in a gruff tone. I know something that tastes much, much tastier. Slowly the young nun turned her head that was soon followed by her body as she now faced hold a deranged middle-aged man that watched her like a predator watch its prey. As she turned her head to left to spot a clear street with no one before she slowly turned to right to spot the same while the man's eyes followed her movements while his deranged smile turned wider. Go on. Run little slut. It will the hunt make so much more fun. Fear was clearly etched on her face, eyes wide she glanced again to her left. But to her horror she discovered not an empty street as it was now occupied by people with the same deranged smile, eyeing her while lazily showing off their light weapons that pulsed different colors. One of them raised his spear and threw it that now sailed through the air and impacted next to her, dust rose up and when the view was clear once more, a gaping hole was left. Run little slut. No one is here that comes to your rescue. The fallen cackled in a high-pitched tone. His small beady pupils stared hungrily at her. Or do you prefer here clearly on the street for all to see? Asia's whole body trembled in fear, slowly she inched away from them that became steps and soon the sounds of someone running echoed through the streets. She clutched her arms between her s as she ran. air escaped her lips that formed clouds in the cold air while she searched for a way to escape. Once more she caught sight of the castle dooming above the houses, and with a small thought she decided to make her escape towards the castle when the cold, Winter cold voice sounds dangerous close. And where are you running to, rabbit? Boom! An explosion occurred close behind her that threw her through the air at where she landed roughly at the hard, unforgiven street. The air blast had shattered her clothes to nothing then her underwear and bra as she with shaking arms pushed herself off the street and continued her escape. WH. What is G. Going on? WH. Oh are they? Asia mentally screamed as she rounded a corner and avoided another blast aiming at her. Her arms clutched her bouncing s while she moved and jumped over a small bench when another explosion happened close behind her. Some, someone please, h, help em, me. Kekakukuku, no one will come to your rescue whore. There is only you and us. Donaseek roared as he threw another light spear towards her when suddenly a blur moved past them and took her stand in front of the nun as her pink spear swatted the spear out of its path. Much to Donaseek's surprise he recognized the nun's rescuer as a wicked smile formed and it seems that we have a traitor in our mid. Or must I say, another sacrifice that we can release our beastly urges on. Asia glanced over the edge of the bench to see a very beautiful girl with long black hair standing in front of her. Her rescuer wears a daring suit that consists of black, strap leather around and under her s that barely covered her erect pink s, a thong-like piece held around her round firm hips by three thin straps, gloves that run right up her arms with small lengths of chains hanging from them shoulder guards on her shoulders with three large spikes sprouting from her right shoulder, and black thigh high heel boots. 
In her right hand she held a pink light spear that she treating aimed at her former comrades. The fallen female scoffed with disgust. Tisk! I am no traitor nor a sacrifice for your sick rituals nor will be the girl behind me. It is you and your comrades that betrayed Azazel Sama with that mysterious leaders of yours. Us? No whore, it is not us that are traitors but you and all that follows that fool, Azazel. He don't fight devils, he don't hate them but instead he tried to make some fake peace treaty that will never happen as long our leader exists. Donacy grinned when he saw the surprised look of Rainair appear on her face. You thought my leader did not know the peace treaty that he tried to sign together with our former brothers and those scum of Asadans? It shows that Azazel is not fit to be a leader, now give us the girl? Never, scum! Rainares snarled, violet eyes flashed dangerously as her light spear disappeared and she crossed her arms in front of her chest while she spread her wings that started to radiate a soft pink glow when suddenly she released hundreds of black feathers in pink aura scattered through the air that hit her former enemies that all fell out of the air. Rainair whirled on her heel, jumped towards Asia and picked her up as she dashed out of the street and towards, she don't know to where. G. Go to T. The castle. Asia screamed from beneath the fallen S that slammed the poor nun in the face when suddenly a lecherous moan pierced the air when Asia accidentally bite the fallen pink when she spoke. I. I am S. Sorry why why why. Ah, ah, damn you. Rainair moaned in anger and embarrassment when she spread her wings and took flight. Her face was crimson do all the blood pumped to her face. Violet eyes slightly glazed while a warm feeling spread through her abdomen as a warm fluid escaped her moist lips between her tights, don't talk. I, I am sorry, please, ah, don't slap, ah, me with your s, mo. Asia whined as she tried to push the s out of her face for air but squeezed them that made them almost escape their leather straps as Rainair tried to ignore the feelings and keeping control of her body. I, is this the, reason thought she was expelled, and perverted none? Rainair mentally screamed as she lost her strength to the great feeling that slowly surged through her body and her fluid made her legs slippery. A trail that her former comrades followed if the sounds of explosion were any indication. Come here slut, I can smell that you want to be speared by my mighty spear, Donaseep doomed up behind her, his eyes firmly focused on her moist snatch as his spear disappeared between her legs, its tipping her moist lips as his spear cracked with electricity that sends shocks through her core. Violet eyes fluttered as she crashed hard back on earth with Asia atop her whom was unconscious and Rainair panting from her unwanted orgasm, you want some more? Rainair in fear crawled away from this mad fallen, pulling Asia with her to a nearby tree where she took her last stand, pink spear appeared again in her hand. With a defiantly glare she prepared herself as Donaseep shot bolt, after bolt at her that caused her pleasure filled cells to flame up as she moaned. Vaguely in a blurry view she noticed more fallen surrounding her and the nun. Her pleasure-filled mind had only one thought, she poked the nun roughly that slowly woke up and stared at her with green fear-filled eyes at her rescuer. Go, save yourself. No, I can't leave you here alone, Asia screamed, her hands firmly clutched her savior as tears streamed down her cheeks. She buried her face into Reynare's chest while hiccuping while the fallen laughed cruelly at the scene. T. They will H. Hurt you. Go. Don't end like me. Go. Rainair desperately yelled at Asia, using her hands to push the nun, Asia away from her, her tear-stained face stared at Asia that looked so broken. She looked as Asia shook her head, refusing to leave her to her own horrifying fate when suddenly a high-pitched, unhuman scream thundered through the air. A scream that caused your hair to stand straight, your skin to goosebumps and your once healthy hair turn gray. Each and everyone's attention traveled towards the source of the unnatural scream and their eyes caught the lone figure of Cain whom stumbled towards them one arm raised in the air, searching for something while his other covered his eyes. Cain. Donacy cried out when he saw the state of his friend, on closer inspection, the fallen could only cry out, I. Is th, at blood? Cain's feet dragged against the surface of the street, his hand searched for something to guide him along the way as he came closer, others could make out the blood trailing down his face. Once or twice Cain tumbled over his feet that thickened his wounds that now were clearly visible on his pale skin in the forms of thin crimson lines where blood seeped out. His clothes were nothing more than rags and you could now hear the soft, shivering voice of Cain whom chanted. He is coming. Darkness is coming. He is coming. He is. Plash. Plash. Cain's knees buckled under him, no longer holding the strength of carrying him and now that he is close to his comrades they could see two black stumps with marred feathers as blood trailed down his back and pooled around him. The fallen lifted up his head, 
showing the source of his blood tears as his comrades and Rainer and Asia stared in the gaping black sockets where his eyes first were and that's when he threw up and the orbs fell out of his mouth and stared at them. He is Kami. Donaseek and his comrades listened before Cain fell lifeless in his own blood as he tried to attempt to warn them for the upcoming danger. Dark blue eyes scanned his surrounding, searching for the perpetrator that dared to harm his friend, daring to take his eyes from him and ends his life. What kind of monster? Wait, is this for what they did to that Yukai? Everyone stay on your guar. Donaseek roared when suddenly an icily, horrifying scream cut him off that rose up above the buildings at where a former comrade of him was keeping watch, no longer. His attention immediately turned towards the scream that slowly died down when suddenly on his left another scream, almost identic to the former scream and he knew that they were in mortal danger. Retreat, everyone pull back. What about the nun and the trado, and companion of Donaseek questioned desperately. A cold chill crawled up his spine when the owner of the voice suddenly mid-speech was cut off, and only to his harness skill of the spear he survived, first of many attacks as he whirled on his heel and at the same moment raised his spear horizontal up to block a bone-white blade that cleaved down. The sound of the air cutting in two followed by his spear that disintegrated in front of his eyes shockingly. A pair of blue-white flower-like eyes drilled in his, rage and hate clearly seen in his eyes. Tap. Tap. Tap sounds of feet rapidly moving over the roofs as a figure sped through the twilight night midnight black waved behind her bright yellow golden cat-like eyes darted from left to right scanning the horizon for any targets that her master ordered to take down watch me sharon everything will be all right the voluptuous young woman thought her attire consists of a black kimono that is open at her shoulders giving a nice view of her large, soft but firm s and is held together by a yellow obi around her slim waist with a set of golden beads. She pushed off at the edge of the roof and sailed through the air, yujutsu. Bunshin no jutsu. The young woman fell in the center of the group of fallen angels, her illusions confused them as her chakra increased her speed and strength. She dashed to her enemies, ed her fist back before she planted a nasty uppercut as the fallen angel sailed through the street and slammed into his comrades. Master want removed from his territory, and I will gladly do my master's bidding, NYA. I, I it's the stray devil. Kill that. Cain roared at the sight of the voluptuous woman whom grinned then winked as she pierced one of his comrades with her hand through his chest before she pulled back to avoid an frontal attack from Cain. You slut, you killed Moses. Era, era I did. She giggled playfully as a blade pierced her throat and a victorious laugh came from the fallen when suddenly the woman's form dispatched. Suddenly out of the shadows a gust of wind caressed his form and a second later an ugly horizon line could be seen around the fallen angel's neck before it sprouted its crimson life fluid as he fell lifeless to the ground, and when his body made contact with the ground his head rolled off his shoulders and rolled up to his comrades as a purple mist seeped into the street as her voice echoed from all sides. And who was this, NYA? Show yourself, whore. You think you can kill us all, come here then. Roared Cain. Crimson eyes scanned his surrounding and he moved his wings to bring himself out of this mist when he suddenly discovered something terrifying. He and many of his surviving comrades noticed that they couldn't move at all and a cold sweat broke out. Now his eyes darted rapidly from left to right, searching for a way to find a way out of this nightmare. Coward. You are a coward if you must lower yourself to use paralysis mists. You are just a cowardice that is only worthy to be ed by me. No, 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 I am no coward. Just cautious, came the amusing voice of their assaulter. Master have teaches me how to dispatch a large group of scums. And only my master is worthy of owning my lecherous body. She purred the last part as she giggled. You and your mast, he was cut off when he heard one of his comrades give one unnatural scream before silence fell and the sounds of several heavy weights falling to the street. His breathing became quick and heavy as his chest tried to held his heart in its place. Crimson eyes darted to right when he saw a vague shadow past him and then left of him as the giggles increased. A huge brock gathered in his throat as he rasped out his pleases. Please, L, let me G, go. Go to your leader, ha ha ha, her voice echoed through the street as the mist vanished and he could move again. With shaking legs he pushed himself off the street and into the air where he stretched his wings and flew to his friend to warn about the infamous Neko show Kuroka. Good luck, Sharon. See ya soon. NYA, Kuroka whispered as she looked in the direction at where she could feel the powers of her master before she vanished for her next mission in a whirl of Sakura petals. Blue-white eyes darted towards the source where he felt a familiar energy and his lips curled up. 
The wind blew in his hair as his attire ruffled in the wind and slowly changed to a white kimono that his predecessor wears before him and his two horns grew out of his head while his hair turned slightly spikier and longer, ready Kaneko-chan. Ready, responded Kaneko with a slight nod as she showed her boxing gloves. Smirk, Naruto's lips stretched as he shot himself into the air. Stretching out his fingers, a black scabbard appeared in his hand that he grasped before he pulled out the blade that immediately cracked with lightning. Thanks, Orochimaru Teme. Let us see what your beloved sword is capable of. Kaneko merely raised an brow at his murmuring as she dived off the roof. Her hand bailed in a first that she slammed into the surface of the street that caused a shockwave as it created a crater and the surrounding fallen angels around her were slammed into the walls by the sudden change in pressure and her ears caught the first screams of one of her friend's victims as she prepared to take her enemies out. Kaneko merely raised an brow at his murmuring as she dived off the roof. Her hand bailed in a first that she slammed into the surface of the street that caused a shockwave as it created a crater and the surrounding fallen angels around her were slammed into the walls by the sudden change in zero pressure and her ears caught the first screams of one of her friend's victims as she prepared to take her enemies out. Shifting her weight to a lower point as she spread her legs slightly and planted her feet firmly in the ground, Kaneko sprinted towards an unexpected fallen angel that recovered from his hard meeting with the wall. Leaning against the wall with his back, he supported himself back to his feet and with a dazing expression his eyes locked on the Neko Show girl. With a painful cough, he started. Cough, do you know who we cough, are? The fallen angel got the silent treatment, seeing her stance he prepared himself for a fight but to his disorientation condition the girl caught him off guard as she stepped into his defensive line and her fist came up that landed with a tremendous powerful punch against his chin and sent him flying. Placing her feet against the wall and pushed herself up as she floated above the fallen angel and slammed her elbow into his neck, knocking him out before she darted towards her next targets, repeating the process with tremendous effective while from the rooftop two pairs of amber-colored eyes watched her. Two shadowy figures, one of them had her hand on the handle of her blade while the other figure held her hand slightly to her hips, ghosting above her pouch. She fight a bit like her, don't you think? The one with her hands ghosting above her pouch whispered to her companion as her eyes kept studying the girl's fighting style. Kaneko back on the street sailed through the air, then somersaulted and stretched her left leg out in a dropkick motion. Her attack missed her intended target by a mere inch as he tilted his head slightly back and prepared to pierce her with his lightning blade when suddenly several whistles sounded through the air that came from small objects that cut through the air and several shurikens planted themselves in his arm. Crying out in pain he lost his concentration and his weapon dissolved that showed an opening for Kaneko that wisely used it to her advantage and rotated her body and a second dropkick came down that hit him square on his back. At contact he slammed hard in the pavement and a small spider web cracks appeared under him, Kaneko's sixth sense immediately goes off and she let herself fall to the ground and rolled aside to avoid several lightning spears while at the other end of the street. Naruto was dancing with his opponents with a feral grin on his face that caused the shadowy figures on the roof to roll their eyes. She and Kaneko have the same fighting style, but Kaneko have much to improve. Spoke the other shadowy figure while watching Naruto with his hand on Kushinaga and draw the blade out of his sheath and vanished from their sight and then sheathing Kushinaga back in his sheath when he appeared behind his opponents and a loud click echoed through the street that signaled a fountain of blood out of his now death opponents. And I think that Naruto want to gift her with her personal weapon that he have copied for jutsu or chakra users. Typical Naruto they laughed in union as the scene shifted back to Naruto whom approached Kaneko whom had just finished her fight and looked with an approved eye at the devastation the young girl had caused with her fighting style and the many knocked out fallen angels. While he knows that these from Grace fallen angels must immediately be eliminated, he could not tell or order the girl to end them, and certainly not now when they are unconscious and defenseless. He placed a gentle hand on her shoulder, guiding her out of the street with the intention to reach the other person with a sacred gear and the two left the street. He made a small hand gesture out of Kaneko's sight that the shadows notices as they pulled out their blades and vanished out of sight. A young girl with light olive complexion with long, wavy black hair and amber-colored eyes, complemented by light purple eye shadow flaring backwards. Her eyes are slightly tilted upwards at the ends, giving her a somewhat cat-like appearance. The girl wears a black ribbon tied in the form of a bow on her head, she wears a white v-neck zip-up shirt that is black along the bottom and has mid-length sleeves. Her belladonna flower emblem is printed in off-white on the left side of the shirt. She wears black pants that have a vertical gray stripe on the outer side of each leg, and she wears a black belt with them where two black cattails waved behind her. In her hand she held a katana and without any remorse she slit their throats before she vanished in the shadows once more and a second figure appeared, 
This one too is a young woman with long, straight blonde hair bound with taut bandages and dark amber eyes. She wears a short-sleeved black and purple blouse, and black pants. She brought her fist to her lips, gathered chakra in her abdomen before calling her technique. Kaden. Kan Senpu. Blue-black fire spiraling around the young women before it was launched towards her targets whom were vaporized to nothing more than ashes before she too disappeared, as the wind spread the remaining of her fallen enemies. The two females darted over the roof, the blonde girl with the long straight blonde hair placed her hand on a smokestack and pushed herself into the air with a curled somersault at which her companion rolled her eyes in exasperation at her flashy movement. Ya no, Naruto is not here to see your acrobatic techniques, Yugito. The dark-haired girl said. She took a sprint, increasing her speed and at the edge of the roof she took a leap and freefall while her right hand pulled out her gamble shroud that folded in a kusarigama that she whirled next to her before releasing her tool that sailed through the air and connected with the roof at the opposite of her as she formed a hand seal and the wall started to glow white with black linings as she flew through the seal. Yugito smirked slightly at the flashy entrance of her teammate before she too followed her through the seal, curling up she rolled at the other end before she jumped up to her feet to see for the first time the underworld. Nay. You speak about my flashy movements, but what about yours, Blake? Yugito retorted teasingly as she joined Blake at the edge of the mountain that looked down at a large castle, slash mansion that lay below them. Her amber eyes lowered at the dwelling that might hold the information that they need for future plans, and do you think we'll find information about them? Pure skills and grace, Blake responded with a purr as her eyes glided for a moment to Yugito before they settled on another figure behind Yugito whom stepped into the light. Just like Blake, this person have long, wavy black hair, amber-colored eyes and remarkable bust that threatened to fall out of her kimono. And I hope they can find information about them. According to Naruto, they are extremely skilled and dangerous. NYA. Ready sisters to throw ourselves in the beak of the phoenix? The third person and member of their team spat the name phoenix in disgust as she stepped between them as the three Nekosho looked down at the castle or mansion of the powerful phoenix clan before they all vanished in a swirl of wind to start their mission. Three shadows glided over the walls of the castle and halted next to a window that was several feet above the ground. A small click was heard when Yugito opened the window, jumped through the window and took her position on the walls to keep an eye for any possible guard or servant. She was soon joined by her two teammates, each one of them wearing a Nako mask, a hoodie that hid their hair and they had exchanged their usual attire to one of Anbu Shinobi wore in the past. Kaneko's amber eyes glared at the familiar walls at where she and her sister had lived in the past before she killed her former master that caused a chain reaction of several horrible events for her kind, and that same action separated her from her sister. With fire of determination she guided her sisters through her former house. Silently they glided over the ceilings, avoiding the burning candles that might expose them to the residents of the Phoenix clan by casting their shadows at the wall. Suddenly the infiltrators came to an halt when a door crept open and a young girl with blonde hair stepped out of the room, and clearly to the sounds of her voice she was not in the best of mood. HMPH. How could he do that to the poor girl? The young girl ranted as she stamped her feet hard on the floor. The person whom is ranting in front of the room wears a light purple dress with dark purple accents and a blue bow at the front. At the back three feather-like extensions mimicking a bird's tail protrude from the dress. She has long blonde hair tied into twin tails, drill-like curls and blue ribbons keeping them in place. The front of her hair has several bangs hanging over her forehead, with a V-shaped fringe hanging over the fridge of her nose. Rias Sama does not deserve a life with that low life of a brother. It seems that even his own sister is in disagreement with his marriage arrangement of the Grammary heiress. Yugito whispered in a low, quiet voice as she watched the girl storm off down the hallway. She scanned her surroundings and stretched out her chakra senses for any nearby living being before she firmly nod to her sister, Kuroka that the area was clear. Leading them towards the basements where her former master held all his plans the group came with the first barricade when they saw the guards guarding the entrance to the achieves. Glancing around the corner she watched how the guards were relieved from their duty and two others took their place, and the Nekosho smirked when one of them pulled out a flask with a possibility of rum. She smirked before pulling her head back. Kuroka turned to her sisters and whispered quietly her plan with some adjustment from Yugito and Blake. That was Kuroka the Nekosho. An S-class rogue devil whom had murdered her former master all in the name of power. That have murdered my squad, no my friends just in the name of her master, wait. Master? Shock masked his face as he replayed her words that she spoke to him. His wings sped up as he slammed them down to make haste towards his leader. 
Kane had an haunted look as he scanned his surrounding with his eyes, clutching his injured arm he retreated back to his thoughts. If that found a new master it would mean that the person is stronger than her. I need report this as fast I can or else our plans could fail with an unknown joining. Unknown to Kane as he was deep in thought, a dark shadow descended upon him with a deadly weapon aimed at him. Otsutsuki Naruto stood on the roof. The wind played with his hair as Kaneko stood next to him as listened to her surroundings when Naruto suddenly spoke. The fallen angel is making his towards us. Kaneko looked up curiously at how he could feel or guess that someone would come towards them, how can feel that? I can feel the life force of the fallen angel. Every living being that lives and breath I can feel as the nature feed them energy. The energy that they get from food, water, air or other ways like the power of nature I can feel, and the difference in them like yours, Kaneko-chan. Like mine? Kaneko cutely tilted her head in a curiously manner as she looked up with her large amber eyes at him that made his heart fluster in his chest. He petted Kaneko's head with love as she leaned in, her arms wrapped around his waist as she felt her heart race quicker and a warmth feeling spread through her whole body. Her ears caught the warm, baritone voice that she loved so much when he started to tell what he feels from her. Kaneko what I feels from you is conflict. Your powers are unstable due your heritage and your new acquired devil's powers that try to fight the nature power in you or better said in terms, your senjutsu powers. The Nekosho eyes burned with anger and slight fear at the mention of senjutsu. She fears that powers as it drove her sister away from her and the annihilation of her kind. Naruto's eyes saddened when he felt her anger and fear when he mentioned senjutsu, bringing her closer to him and a warm embrace. Nay, Kaneko, there is no reason to fear senjutsu. Kaneko's head immediately shot up, her amber eyes flared in anger at her crush whom ignored her glare and just continued his reason at why. Senjutsu is the powers of nature and life but also emotions that could control us if we keep them not chained. My mother have taught us in the Nekomata that later became the Nekosho the importance of Senjutsu. Senjutsu is all about life, balance and emotions that only pure Nekosho can use Senjutsu without any backslash, and when your sister and now you turned into devils the balance was broken. Tears gathered at the corner of Kaneko's eyes as she might finally get an answer for her questions that everyone kept from her, balance broken? What do you know about devils? She frowned at the question as her answers are again held out of her reach that she desperately want to know, but she answered nevertheless. Devils are beings made out of negative emotions. Kaneko's amber eyes widened when she cut herself off when the dots connected. She lowered her head to her small s and her hand reached towards the valley of her s where she knew that a devil's piece was hiding. The devil's peace caused us to lose control of our powers, balance broken. Indeed. You being a devil caused the imbalance of your powers. With each passing year as you matured your senjutsu powers will grow in your body that will each time send small burst of powers outside your body. But with the devil peace inside you it will only corrupt your powers and nature around you that on her turn will try to purify you and fight inside you against the devil's peace to bring balance back to her guardians. Guardians? With his explanation. Kaneko only gained a few answers that on their turn brought more questions but also insight at what her kind was. She was really glad that she had met Naruto that have the knowledge and history Nekosho and Nekomata, her kind. The Neko girl was only saddened that she and her sister were the only left in the world, and she could not entirely place the blame on her sister that she did in the past as she now knows that devils were partly at fault as well with turning her and her sister to half devils. I will explain later to you about the history of Nekomata and Nekosho the guardians of nature. But for now, I need to set an example out of this fallen angel. Started Naruto as he freed himself from Kaneko's embrace whom pouted at the loss of her warmth and comfort. The Oni took an Iido stance with his hand on the blade Kushinaga and he spread his legs slightly while closing his eyes and focused at his surroundings. Kaneko stared intently at his stance, her eyes didn't blink as she was afraid that she would miss something when suddenly his arm blurred and not a second later a dull thud with the accompanied cry echoed through the street. It happened too fast for her eyes to follow his motions as he suddenly jumped down with Kaneko following him. There she noticed the sorry state of the fallen angel whom lay there down in a pool of his own blood, his wings were cut off and you could see small feathery stumps and several cuts adorned his body. Naruto stepped forward, a cold smile adorned his face. Well, well what do we have here, a from grace fallen angel just like his father. Came the fallen angel that had offered unintently his tainted blood to Kushinaga whom hissed angrily at the foul taste that tainted her form as it glowed eerily in front of the fallen whom tilted his head to glare up at his attacker that dared to take his wings, the sign of being an angel. No matter if they were from grace of fallen, he was proud of his wings that were taken from him. 
something no one else would have ever done before, but someone did and the same person had at the same time stopped him from delivering important information about the stray that was no longer a stray. Still glaring up at his attacker, Kane spat out blood that fell in front of the Ona's feet that merely glared down at him with a slight smirk playing on his lips. With a gurgling as blood seeped out his mouth. You fool! You have no idea with whom you just messed. The Oni merely raised his brow before he spoke in a lower, colder tone than with which the now wingless fallen tried to. I've taken the wings of Cain, a from heaven and from grace angel that had just run away from a fight with the stray that determinates your whole team. You were on your way to deliver a message to your superior. Ha! Huh. You think I will deliver a message for you to my superior? Fool! Laughed the crazy fallen maniacally when his eyes suddenly caught the sight of a young girl. Kane gained a lecherous smirk when he undressed Kaneko with his eyes. The from grace fallen angel was cast out of heaven when he started to visit earth every night with the intention of raping young girls and impregnate them. The cries and anxious that they radiate when he burst their cherry, the flow of their virginity blood flowing down his shaft and finally the dumping of his potential seed was all he lived for. Original he thought of taking the nun for the whole night but now with this girl, the most delicious young girl that he had ever seen and he was cast out when God activated the system because the people lost fate in him. But all his frustration and loss of his wings can be made up by taking this girl, and it seems as if fate had smiled down at him as he could see the love of this girl that she felt for this strange, white-haired figure that he need to take out. You dare to look at what is mine, you dare to claim what holds my heart, let me show you what happens to those that tries to take what is not their own. Cain's thoughts were cut off by his assaulter whom glared at him icily. His eyes widened when he fell a painful pressure on his eyes, it hurts, an animalistic scream erupted out of his throat when his sight darkened and then with a sickening plop, his eyes were taken from him. No longer will you set your sight on innocence, and certainly not at what is mine, be gone. Kaneko turned away when she felt the cold chill came off from her crush that was followed by an inhuman scream that reverberated through the street that surely would wake anyone from their sleep. She held her eyes tight trying to shut out the screams as they slowly died until there was only silent left, and yet, she still held her eyes shut when suddenly arms wrapped around her form and she stiffened. The Nekosho tried to get out of the embrace when suddenly the soothing voice of her crush whispered in her ears, I am sorry. I am sorry that you saw that ugly side of mine, the side of a monster. But I do not regret what I did to him, he deserves everything and a bit more. Why? quietly whispered Kaneko, her voice muffled in his chest as tears streamed down her cheeks. She clamped his collar while pressing herself closer to him. Why am I not afraid of you? Why can I easily accept this? Why? I cannot give you an answer on your questions, but I promise you, I am here for you, my love. Kaneko's eyes shot open at the confession of her crush. For the past days she had wished for those two words. But now, what he would do to those that look at her the wrong way or those that tries to claim her for their own or if they ever try to hurt her? What would he do? Will he do that again? She needs someone to talk to someone that can help her understand her feelings for him. Kaneko slowly pushed his arms away from her, and slowly tilted her head up to look him in the eyes. I love you too, Naruto. Naruto felt his heart roar but with her next words it fell. But I need to think, this new side of yours. I don't know why you did that, and I need to talk to someone. Excuse me. Naruto watched Kaneko ran away from him, slowly her form shrunk until she vanished out of sight as Naruto stood there frozen. Clasping his hands tightly, fire burning in his eyes as he whirled around to glare at the fallen behind him and Kusanagi sprang to life as he tortured the beings that had taken or ruined everything for him. If Kane had still eyes, they would grew to dinner plates in fear as Naruto's true form appeared that crushed his battered body alone all with his pressure. Time to replay a small part of your father's sins. Laughter ran through the dungeons at where the two guards stood watch. One of them held a bottle of rum in his hand as he told his comrade a funny story. And I offered her a drink, hick, she was all mine for the night, hick. Oh that was the best night ever. I think we can top that night, right Miltia? A sultry voice entered the building. The two guards turned their heads towards the source of the voice only to smile stupidly when their eyes fell on the voluptuous figures of two identical twins. Two pairs of eyes roamed the scandalous almost form of the twins whom showed unashamed their full, round s that were packed in a small school top were their rosy, diamond hard s pushed against the fabric. Water left the guards' lips as they kept staring at them as they sauntered towards them, their hips swaying sensual as their eyes fell on a small micro skirt that barely covered their slit, if only they would bend then they would see their sacred cave. You are right, Melanie, 
The twins were now close to the guards whom slowly tried to reach them with their hands when suddenly the twins' fingers wrapped around their arm and pulled them forward and delivered a hard punch to their chest, followed by a barrels of fists and kicks that landed each with a painful hit. No one, and no one will touch us except master. Right you are, what we not do for love, Megan, Narakuni no jutsu. Miltia whispered as she cast her favorite technique, demonic illusion, hell viewing technique. She stared at the guards in disgust before the sisters dropped their henge and returned to their normal form. Miltia, now Blake gave the one that tried to touch her a painful kick between his legs before she used the technique again hench herself into the guardian and pulled him out of view as did Melanie, or as she knows, her sister Yugito that followed her suit. Yugito and Blake took their position as Kuroka had slipped into the Achieve room and sniffed to look for the papers. Kuroka sniffed through papers and was surprised to find out a lot of dirty secrets that the Phoenix Clan's second son did in his name. She knew the second son, her former master and to see that he had planned a lot of things that caused her turn to S-class criminal and other horrible things when she read at how her kind was hunted down. But above all, she found out that he was still alive as several documents were from recent dates with the plans of freeing a beast with untold powers. Copying them quickly, she secured the documents between the valley of her s and left the room to join her sisters. Seeing them staying guard they vanished from the Phoenix estate. A high-pitched, unhuman scream thundered through the air. A scream that caused your hair to stand straight, your skin to goosebumps and your once healthy hair turn gray. Each and everyone's attention traveled towards the source of the unnatural scream and their eyes caught the lone figure of Kane whom stumbled towards them, one arm raised in the air, searching for something while his other covered his eyes. Kane. Donacy cried out when he saw the state of his friend. On closer inspection, the fallen could only cry out, I. Is th, at blood? Kane's feet dragged against the surface of the street, his hand searched for something to guide him along the way as he came closer others could make out the blood trailing down his face. Once or twice Cain tumbled over his feet that thickened his wounds that now were clearly visible on his pale skin in the forms of thin crimson lines where blood seeped out. His clothes were nothing more than rags and you could now hear the soft, shivering voice of Cain whom chanted. He is coming. Darkness is coming. He is coming. He is. Plash. Plash. Cain's knees buckled under him no longer holding the strength of carrying him and now that he is close to his comrades they could see two black stumps with marred feathers as blood trailed down his back and pooled around him. The fallen lifted up his head, showing the source of his blood tears as his comrades and Rainer and Asia stared in the gaping black sockets where his eyes first were and that's when he threw up and the orbs fell out of his mouth and stared at them, he is Kami. Donaseek and his comrades listened before Cain fell lifeless in his own blood as he tried to attempt to warn them for the upcoming danger. Dark blue eyes scanned his surrounding, searching for the perpetrator that dared to harm his friend, daring to take his eyes from him and ends his life. What kind of monster? Wait, is this for what they did to that Yukai? Everyone stay on your guar. Donaseek roared when suddenly an icily, horrifying scream cut him off that rose up above the buildings at where a former comrade of him was keeping watch, no longer. His attention immediately turned towards the scream that slowly died down when suddenly on his left another scream almost identic to the former scream and he knew that they were in mortal danger. Retreat. Everyone pull back. What about the nun and the trado, and companion of Donacy questioned desperately. A cold chill crawled up his spine when the owner of the voice suddenly mid-speech was cut off, and only to his harness skill of the spear he survived, first of many attacks as he whirled on his heel and at the same moment raised his spear horizontal up to block a bone-white blade that cleaved down. The sound of the air cutting in two followed by his spear that disintegrated in front of his eyes shockingly. A pair of blue-white flower-like eyes drilled in his, rage and hate clearly seen in his eyes. You and your kind will not escape me. Donaseek stared at the creature in front of him. It towered far above him and then untold pain surged through his back when his wings was ripped off. His pride, and his sign of power was taken from him before darkness claimed him as pain left him. Lifeless fell his body to the ground while the oni roared into the night sky. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.